Such a wonderful turnout. I mean, water. What's, what's up with that? That's not interesting at all, is it? No. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to our water summit. I can't remember how many times we've done this, Suzanne. How many times we've done it? Four, I think this five, is our fourth. Fourth or fifth water summit. Um, I am uh, Rebecca Grossman, the CEO of Scottsdale Realtors, and it's just a pleasure to have all of you here today. Uh, before we get started, I always have some housekeeping information for you. Um, our Wi-Fi information is listed if you need it, and I think it's listed. Is it listed somewhere on the screen? No. Oh, we're getting there. Sorry. Uh, it's uh, Venue 600 guest, and the password is classroom, all lowercase, just in case they don't get that up on the screen. Um, we have uh, coffee and tea and water over here. So, and oh my gosh, there's cookies. Cookies. So there are some snacks for you. This uh, event, because we have so much to cram into a short amount of time, um, we do what we call self-breaking. So we will not take an official break, but feel free to take it on your own. There are restroom, banks of restrooms right across here. There's unisex but, uh, restrooms to the right. There's a cafe if you have to have something other than what we provided. So please take the time to do that if you need to. Also, make sure your phones are on silent. Mm -hmm. You just take a moment to look at that and make sure that that is taken care of. Regarding Q and A, you will need to use the Slido question and answer QR code. And I believe you're going to put that on the screen. Are you going to put that on the screen for me? We are. You are. <laughs> In a minute, I'll talk slower. Um, located on the card. Oh, well, they got it in registration. Did they get it in registration? Yeah. Okay, so everybody called. Oh, yeah, cool. So you've got those cards, and what you're going to do is you're going to scan that, and it's going to take you to a page where you can actually enter your questions, and then at the end, during the Q&A, um, I will have a, uh, an iPad, and we'll be pulling those up, um, as many as we can get to, at the end of our presentation. All right, you will also, um, there's a digital resource materials that you will receive after the uh, course today and it'll have all the presenter slides and um, that have given us their permission to share. But we like to trick you to get the goodies, so we ask that you first do an evaluation before it takes you to the link with those resource pages. It's very important to us that we get the input from you as how we can improve upon this in the future, what you got out of it, what was most meaningful for you, so please take the time to do that. Next, I wanna take a moment to recognize our leadership in the room. Uh, with us today. So we have Chris Nates, our president. I, did I see Chris come in? Hopefully he's going to join us pretty soon. Is our president-elect here, Peggy Neely. Oh, man, we tired him out at the DC meetings at NAR last week, I, I do believe. Um, how, uh, oh, Allison Cahill, I thought I saw Allison. Nope. How about Sandy, Sandy Lunsford? <laughs> Stand up, Sandy, yay! <laughs> our media past president and Stacy Prolak, our treasurer. And any board members that are in the room that I didn't mention? Oh, yes, Aaron Bills. Say hi, Aaron. Anybody else? Did I miss anyone? Okay, fantastic. We're glad you're here. And of course, I can't go any further. This kind of a seminar takes a lot of coordination and putting things together, so I have to recognize our Government Affairs Director, Suzanne Brown. Wave, Suzanne. Hi. Is and uh, Corinne Duran, who handles all our events, all the technical details. Thank you, Corinne. You guys have done a great job. And we have, of course, two marketing partners today that I'd like to call out. First, our river, I love the names of these marketing partners. The river marketing partner is Mary Slake with Fidelity National Home Warranty. Wave Mary. Wave Mary. And thank you for, for being here today. And then we have Helena Donahoe with American Title Service Agency, and she is our watershed sponsor. Watershed. Thank you both of you. So, to kick off our event, I would now like to invite Deputy, Deputy Director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources, Clint Chandler, to the stage to give us an overview of water in Arizona. Prior to joining the department, Clint, Clint was employed by the United States Senate, having served on the respective staffs of Senators Pete Dominici, John Pyle, and Jeff Flake. 
It's a lot of varied personalities there, right? <laughs> he must have had been very busy. He worked on Capitol Hill as a legislative staffer attending to budget and tax matters and has occupied state-based staff roles. Clint also has acted as the Vice President of Business Advocacy and Government Relations for the Greater Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce and was employed as the Principal Budget Analyst for the New Mexico House Republican Caucus. Clint is an honors graduate of the University of New Mexico with a triple major in economics, history, and political science. And I gotta tell you, we're gonna have a lot of overachievers that you're gonna hear about today, and this is just our first one. Um, and a member of the university's football team, very good, and has lived and studied in Mexico. Please help me welcome Clint Chandler. Well, thank you for that intro. And I've always many times thought that I need to kind of pare back my bio. <laughs> On the to-do list. And thank you for the opportunity. So real nice. Um, basically, the director and I divvy up the speaking engagements. He handles, uh, for the most part, national media. But in the last year or so, I have no other group has um, sent in as many invitations that I've been a part of um, than realtors, and most of them have been here in Scottsdale. In fact, um, and it's really been, it back just to one year ago but this week, and I went into one building and I went to the wrong office, and they said why I was there, and they said, well, you need to come talk to us too. And I said, okay. So I added them as well. I think I was over here in this building in November. Um, and I understand why. Basically, you're, You have clients, your clients have questions, and you're very close to the situation. Um, and you have a, a direct interest in you know, perceptions of our, in reality, of our water situation. And I've been happy to show up and talk uh, about Arizona's water status. So I'll begin with what I call our Arizona commercial. I begin with something very positive. There's so much to commend our state relating to our legacy of water leadership. You can pick your time frame. You can go back centuries to the Otham peoples and other Native Americans that settled this area and um, elsewhere in the state, or you can go back to the past. Um, half century or more to you know, giants like Michael Rabat, Sean Kyle, Bruce Babbitt, Stan Turley, and others who helped to well situate us with uh, water law and policy. So you know, we truly do stand on the, their shoulders and there's a lot that we can point to to, to establish our, our water bona fides. And this is a a graph that's been produced by the department and widely circulated. And as you can see, basically we are at parity with the, the circumstance, the water usage from 1957, even though our population has increased by 555% and our economy has grown by 2,137%. So that's good stuff. You know, it's all very encouraging. There's you know, significant complexity there behind that. There's a lot of different elements that have contributed to that result. But I also emphasize that, um, you know, we're already into a, a new era where existing challenges are intensifying and new challenges, novel challenges are emerging. So. As you're well aware, as consumers of the news, that you know, there's been a, a rapid deterioration until really this past um, this past winter, you know, this past water year, in the Colorado River system, and so you know, we have been um, working to answer those challenges. But those circumstances have been 
outpacing our response. Some of those may be familiar to you and others uh, you may never have heard of, you know, the OSEP guidelines, the drop contingency plan, which is much more familiar, the 500 plus plan, um, the exchange of letters that occurred last year, the protection volume discussions that didn't really produce anything, and then the, the current discussion in the context of the draft supplemental environmental impact statement. Um, and then going beyond Colorado River, I'd like to kind of begin with this because have a limited amount of time and hit some of the key takeaways and then I'll just progress through the presentation and work in packet and I'm going to be followed by Patrick Jam with the Central Arizona Project and he's going to expand on Colorado River significantly more. Um, there are also insured water supply related issues and that is something else that is commendable. It's a it's a part of the uh, 1980 uh, landmark uh, legislation, the Groundwater Management Act, and that's something that has big implications for your industry. In fact, in previous presentations, I made it a bit interactive and asked questions, and that's informed my discussions and with others about the, the efficacy of this program, and you're gonna be hearing more about that in the news in the, in the months to come, but it's something that has, from what I've heard from folks in the industry, has a direct uh, impact on property values. You know, the 100 year guarantee of, um, you know, what we call fiscal availability of uh, the renewable sources. And I'll explain that a little bit more, it's a fair bit there. But then sometimes these issues, because of the, uh, the, you know, our excellence in water management and the way things are tethered together and the diversity of our water sources, you'll see where they intersect. Like with our short water supply program, there is that Colorado River component. We have to, given the situation on the river, ascertain whether we're gonna to continue to provide the same allowance for what's known as the non-Indian agriculture pool. I don't expect you to know what that is, but it's like one of the lower priority pools within the CHP system. And so do we give the cities the same amount of credit for that that we have in recent years, or we ratchet that down? And that has implications for assured water supply determinations. So go ahead. So Arizona water use by source. Uh, we have a diversified portfolio, distributed sources. Again, this is something that uh, benefits us, commends us. I would encourage you to listen carefully to the discussions about Colorado River. Scottsdale uses a very uh, significant amount of Colorado River water. Discussing that with Gretchen a bit ago, she said it's about 75% that could be adjusted. But there is, Scottsdale is very well managed. Um, very capable people managing your water supplies, but there is that um, reliance, especially in the northern part of the city, on Colorado River water. Uh, Scottsdale also receives, and I'm sure Rich will talk about this, SRP water. So you see the in-state rivers, that 18% is, for the most part, not entirely Salt River project water, which is a more resilient system. Doesn't mean that there aren't ebbs and flows, but across the span of years, it does have more consistency, more performance. Uh, reclaimed water, 5%, and groundwater is 41%. We also have, um, as a result of legislation from 1986, where we, uh, the underground storage and prepping program was established, um, uh, we have water that's, uh, that's banked to the ground, that's about uh, 14 million acre feet, 13, 14 million acre feet. And then there's not quite 4 million acre feet that's stored underground through the Arizona Water Banking Authority. And that was um, established in legislation in 1996. You can see water use by sector, 22% municipal use, 6% industrial use, and that includes golf. 
agricultural <coughs> use. And during the last two panels that I was on, I really took time to commend our, the, to just give a bit of an explanation about our ag sector. I don't have uh, the minutes today to do that, except to say in Yuma, which have high priority Colorado River rights, they do, um, they do their work very well, they do it very efficiently. They really are the, the standard for the nation and they're the nation's, uh, you know, for our country, they are the winter vegetable capital. And you're gonna be hearing about them, the broader water conversations uh, more frequently going forward. ADWR's critical functions, I won't go through all of these. Uh, basically, said it's essence, DWR has policy, planning, and regulatory functions. You see Colorado River Management. So my boss, Director Kuchotsky, is Arizona's governor's representative. So he is Arizona's principal in Colorado River Matters. It, he's the, the point person for the state in the Colorado River negotiation. We used to be the United States and the other basin states. And we're often joined at the table with general manager and others from the Central Arizona Project, Patrick, often there, um, perhaps certain other stakeholders. Go through, you see statewide regional planning. I mean, every one of these is important. I don't have really the time to go through every bit of it, but also, as I said, I'm gonna stop and talk a bit about the administration of the assured and adequate water supply program. So, storage in the system. This is um, total system storage, since we have one with folks late um, towel and bead, and this is across the system, but it's basically the same. As you can see, we have been, until recently, fairly stable. So we were at approximately 94% of storage in the system in the late 1990s, and then had a five-year period during which uh, those storage levels plunged. And that included a really crummy year of 2002, which was the worst year in the past 30, 30 year period. And that provided the impetus for the negotiations that yielded the 2007 interim guidelines. Uh, for, again, for a time there was stability in the system. And then in 2018, the system went from approximately 57% to down to 47 to, oh, sorry. Okay, so that was, I have a voice that projects this off and not Yeah, right. over here, I think it has a Sure, sure. Um, is that better? Yeah, yes. I'll yeah. Need to yeah just like your So in recent years, it's been, you know, around, um, 47, 45% until the last year it was 34% for the system. Again, this year about 34. Um, lakes mean power are about a quarter full, and that's gonna rise a bit. So um, the projections uh, are that Lake Mead will rise to about 35% and Powell to approximately 38%, but that's after a terrific winter what I call Bonanza Hydrology. That's gonna be the next slide. Patrick's gonna talk about that a bit. So just think about that for a moment. Even after such a, a tremendous um, winter, we're still only having that kind of a rise in the, the lake levels and an increase in the, the system storage. Really over the last 25 years, we've had five years that were above average runoff. So that indicates that even with a very good year, often well, that's been the experience, right? For the past quarter century, to go back into uh, another dry period. We don't know if that's going to happen, but that's what we have to plan for. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Patrick has a similar slide. I just want to emphasize the runoff. So that's been a big part of the situation: is um, a diminished runoff efficiency. So even so sometimes we were close to um, average snowpack, the runoff was much less because of um, the aridification. 
So if it's hotter, drier, it's a longer um, warm season, it warms sooner in the spring, and you have the warm winds that just whip away the, the moisture and you have dry soils. And so you end up with what you see there, those, uh, those lower numbers, those lower percentages for runoff. Of course, that's less water into the, the, the lakes, less water into the system. You can go right past this. Patrick has this same slide. You'll see the key elevations at Lake Mead uh, are considerable distance above the critically low elevations. But you can see where Power Pool is, 950, and 895 is dead pool. At the, that's the level at which you can't, the water can no longer move past the, the dam. But we're, again, a considerable distance above that. I won't spend a lot of time on this either. This is the from the April 24 month study. So there are min, most, and max probable. So min probable, minimum probable. Uh, there's a lot regarding methodology that I don't have time to talk about. Probably, I mean, I don't think you want to hear about every bit of that. Um, if I'm wrong, you can call and ask, and I will explain. Um, but the min probable is the 10 percentile, the most probable is 50th and max is the 90th percentile, and they make decisions off of, uh, so there are operational decisions with the August study that are made off of the most probable projection. And currently that is um, about 1068, so about seven feet below 1075. Uh, there are tier thresholds that are associated with those uh, for the end of this year. And last year, I don't know, yeah, with the August, study from last year, the most probable projection was for elevation 1025. So the, the improved hydrology has given that kind of a lift to the system. Lake Powell, now this was much more in the mix with the conversations from last year. Um, as far as the, the key elevations, the, um, the critically low elevations, you can see 3490 is the, the power pool level, that's the turbines, go below that to um, you know the, the next level there, that's um, the bypass tubes, the river outlet works. So in the spring of last year, just you know, we were just consummating, you know, working through those issues, the, the, the Department of the Interior had issued a decision just about this time last year because the lake levels had declined so much that there was concern that we might not be able to move water past the dam. So I was talking earlier about novel challenges, new challenges. So that was a, a major new challenge. We had never been there before. In fact, there was, we don't really talk a lot about the conversations in the basement meetings, but there was one instance where an executive from Reclamation said that we have no operational experience, or little operational, I should say, experience with this, and a political appointee said, correction, we have no operational experience with this. We have never been here before. Just that possibility of um, having the levels decline so much to uh, really to the low power pool and having that inability because they weren't sure about the um, whether the, the bypass tubes could run 24/7, 365, and so we didn't want to get that far down and, and have the inability, possibly, of moving water past Glen Canyon Dam. That would have meant no water in Grand Canyon. So I'm going to need to speed up quite a bit here. I'm going to move past Lake Powell, except to say. Um, you can see that with this, the man most max. Uh, for the previous three years, we were trending down close to the red line every year. So we were close to the 10th percentile every one of those years. And of course you have the, the resulting um, substantial declines in storage. So these are the the implementation tables for the, the 07 guidelines and drought contingency plan and the 
and it was Mexico, uh, the, we were in Tier 2A, we had a um, PCP in 07 guidelines contribution of 592,000 acre feet. We are projected to be in Tier 1, so that's less water. Um, but that could change. We have, that Patrick's going to talk about that in a moment. Um, we'll have a lot of time to discuss the, uh, the drought environmental impact statement. But that could shift the the operational guardrails significantly. I do want to mention, and I think this merits considerable emphasis, that Arizona has been contributing over and above. So is in addition to um, those first two that I just referenced, through reclamation funded system conservation, we are um, supporting the system with 260,000 acre feet and then an additional 43,000 acre feet of ICS preservation, so that's also um, propping up those lake levels. So this is something you probably have heard about in the news. It was um, receiving national press coverage in the um, latter part of January and into early February. So this is the, the draft supplemental environmental impact statement. So this is, uh, supplement to the record of decision to the um, 07 guidelines, the 2007 guidelines that I had referred to earlier. And that, basically the impetus for that was, you know, extending back to last fall, of course, we didn't have a crystal ball, and we're aware that uh, we'd have such a good winter, for one thing, and they were planning, of course you have to plan for um, what could, go badly. And so they were in the United States Department of the Interior was considering the possibility of 2002 hydrology. So remember I said that was the worst in the last 30 year period. If that would have occurred, the system would have crashed. And so they needed new tools. Under current law, they are unable to release less than 7 million acre feet out of Glen Canyon Dam to the Grand Canyon to, to Lake Mead because they wanted to have the ability or at least study to go through that process to provide for a lower release, maybe adjust the tier threshold, provide additional tools to answer the eventuality of, uh, of having such poor hydrology or somewhere maybe, maybe a bit more than that. But we did have the winter that we had. Um, that's something that is uh, in the mix there are continuing discussions. They did release the, um, the draft in April, and it had these two <coughs> alternatives. One is by priority, and with this, this is, this is bad. I mean, so the CAP system would just get hammered, just could dry up the CAP system. Um, and Patrick's got some good tables that, graphs that he can show you Overall, Arizona's share could decline down to maybe 680,000 acre feet. So only the highest priority users under this scenario would receive water. So we don't want this to happen, and that's under certain circumstances, right? Then there's the pro rata. We did advocate for pro rata reductions. Um, this includes the certain reductions by an interpretation of priority, but also by um, a percentage per rata, um, you know, sh share. Uh, that also has, it, it basically, in its entirety, undesirable, very undesirable uh, potential impacts for Arizona. So we're continue, continuing to negotiate. There's some very um, fluid discussions that are occurring. Patrick and I are going to leave in just a bit. We're going to head over and discuss some of the substance of that and you know, the status and uh, so it's all happening in real time. I'm going to need to, if I could just jump over quickly, I'm going to leave the basic discussions to Patrick. Uh, I want to talk about just very quickly the assured and adequate water supply program. So you may have heard about what's occurred in 
Canal County and then the Hacienda <coughs> Subbasin. So in order to obtain a designation or a redesignation or a certificate, water users have to, applicants have to provide a report that is acceptable, a hydrological report that is acceptable to the director. And the department has and had in 2019 put forward a, a model report that showed unmet demand in Pinal that had implications for growth. That was the governor on growth in the Pinal model domain, which is largely the Pinal AMA. And then in uh, January, Governor Hobbs announced during the State of the State speech the release of the Hacienda model that has implications for development construction of houses in the Hacienda subbasin, that area to the west of the, the white thing. Just to give you at a glance an idea of um, the, really the essential elements of the program. Fiscal availability for 100 years, basically so it's fiscally, continuously, and legally available for 100 years. It has sufficient water quality, the financial capability to construct the necessary works, consistency with the management goal, and the consistency with the management plan. I know I need to come in for a landing, so I will, I want to end with that. Um, quite a bit to talk about, but I did not want to leave this undiscussed since, um, again, it has impact, has implications for your industry. And this is where these presentations have helped me, again, talking to um, different realty, basically realty organizations and asking questions sometimes. Um, and just as I'm working my way through a presentation other times after the meeting, just hearing about the significance of that program for your business because it does provide that that support for for property values it does um, provide that confidence and that's something that you can relay back to your your clients so i will close with that okay. thank you Clem. affectionately known as CID. Um, he is the Director of Water Policy, and he's going to enlighten us, I love that, no pressure, he's going to enlighten us, um, on the CAP, what, how, what, it, what the CAP is all about. So, let's just say a little bit about you, because there's some very impressive things in here. Um, Patrick is a registered professional engineer in the state of Arizona. He joined CAP in 2000 in the Water Operations Group as an engineer focused on the system modeling and engineering support for the operations of the CAP Aqueduct. He was, has worked with numerous groups within CAP, including operations, engineering, power, and water policy. He has held numerous leadership positions, including supervising CAP's engineering resources and water system groups, recharge operation, and as the manager of water operations responsible for the 24-7 real-time operations of the CAP system. Patrick's role at CAP has consistently been connected to administration of CAP's water delivery contracts and the nexus between water policy and operation of the CAP system. In October 2019, he was named the Director of Water Policy, which oversees Colorado River programs, resource planning and analysis, and the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District. His group is responsible for long-range planning, policy analysis, development and program implementation, for the CAP service area, the Colorado River, and the CAGRD. Please welcome Patrick Dunn. For that bio. I actually did shorten mine, and I don't know how it doesn't get sent out ahead of mine. Ahead of <laughs> me. So I, uh, 
apologize for all the engineering stuff that was in there. And I had a question if self breaks apply to the speaker. Like, that yes, they definitely do. Um, I'm, I'm certainly grateful to be here today and have the opportunity to talk about the Colorado River. And before I start, I, I just want to point out it is not lost on me that a group of realtors got asked to silence their phones <laughs> while someone gave a talk about water. <laughs> And you've done it. So, so I feel pressure just because of that. That is true commitment based on the relatively small group of realtors that I've met in my life. So, so thank you for that. I appreciate you giving me some attention today. Uh, Clint did a great job of walking through some of the some of the Colorado River items, and there is a little bit of redundancy in our in our messages today. And, and I would say, I think Clint laid down an excellent base coat of the Colorado River situation that we're talking about, but, but I'm gonna bring the sexy pinstriping um, <laughs> that makes it look good. So I'm happy to be here and talk about CAP today. And I hope I've added enough levity at the beginning of my talk that you'll forget about all the engineering accolades that were included in my bio. <laughs> so, glad to be here. So um, as Clint talked a little bit about, talking about the Colorado River, it's certainly been in the news a tremendous amount over the last three years. Declining water levels, found bodies in barrels, mm -hmm. emerging, emerging houseboats and other stuff that have uh, cropped up as the lake levels have, have declined over the last 20 years. And, and Clint pointed this out, and I, I think it's a, a good thing to continue with, is the current uh, elevations of the two reservoirs are, are sub 30%, and that is right now. Um, despite it being 100 degrees in the valley, it is still cold in the upper basin, uh, and this, a lot of the water that we expect to come in is still frozen. And so the inflow has started into Lake Powell. It's flowing in at about 60,000 uh, cubic feet per second, um, and I'll put that in some context. Mm -hmm. Um, CAP uh, pumps about 120 to 130,000 acre feet in a month if we were to fully divert our, our uh, 1.5 million acre feet a year. That's 60,000 CFS, you're getting about 120,000 acre feet into Lake Powell in a day. So they're getting um, a lot of water in right now. I actually expect the runoff to intensify uh, over the coming weeks as it continues to, to warm up. In, in, uh, in the upper basin, and we see that, that snowpack make its way into the reservoir. Clint gave out some good stats. I confirmed them, um, and he shared his graph, and his, his was more updated than mine. It had more, uh, more um, up to date of the snow equivalent. But Clint had indicated that with the runoff uh, that we expect in 2023, that Lake Mead would go from that uh, about uh, 20, or Lake Powell, sorry go from about that 23% up to 38%. Uh, Lake Mead will also go up, and I'm gonna talk about why in a minute. Um, Lake Mead is downstream of Lake Powell, just in case you didn't know, there's Lake Powell, Grand Canyon, Lake Mead. And Lake Mead um, relies, its, its water level is much more reliant on the releases actually from Grand Canyon Dam. So you'll see Lake Powell move up and down a lot more associated with really the runoff in the system. But Lake, Lake Mead has some uh, different sorts of factors that affect it, and I'll talk about those in a minute. But first, let's focus on Lake Powell. Clint said that it was gonna go from 23% up to 38%, um, and that's just an indication that while this is an absolutely great year on the system, and that's what this long chart says to me, um, this is the historic unregulated inflow uh, going back I believe to 1965 to present uh, into Lake Powell. Those high bars in the 80s um, were really the highest in the measured record and at that time uh, almost 40 million acre feet spilled to the ocean. Those inflows were were greater than could be stored within these within these two reservoirs. Hmm. We've seen those reservoirs decline to about 25% over the last 20 years. And this year's inflow is certainly a top 10 in the last 50. And on this graph, it's mostly reflected, we think by the black bar on the far right there. So it's not the highest that we've seen, but it's probably the second highest we've seen in the last 20 years, with, with the exception of 2011. 
And what we'd really like to see is a cluster of them, um, as occurred in the early 80s or there even in the mid 90s. But, but we don't we don't know if that's gonna gonna happen yet. But this year, a good year, above average year, more than double what the last um, three individually have been, and we'll see the lake move from 23 to 38. We'll see it move from 23 to 70 or 100 or something like that. The reservoir won't, won't quite fill, which means there will still be articles about the Colorado River and low water levels and, and, and those kinds of things, um, and the common statement that uh, one good year does not uh, drought completely resolve the Colorado River. <coughs> Um, these are the graphs that project the elevations. Um, I'm hoping largely you can ignore them, but I will use the laser pointer. This bump up right here in the blue is kind of what we're expecting with the spring runoff. And then what happens in the next, they call this the 24 month study, what happens in the next two years are really just a statistical range of where we think the lake uh, will probably go based on our historic observations. Do we know how much snow there's going to occur in the Colorado River system next winter? No, we don't know that. We know a range of what we've observed. If anybody knows the weather in the Colorado River Basin next year, great, you can tell me and you can give the talk next time <laughs> because you'll, you'll be ahead of, of the forecasters. In that way. But based on what we've historically observed, there will be a downward trend in Lake Powell, and that's because the existing rules on the Colorado River uh, essentially allow more water to be released to the lower basin than is expected in that, on that average hydrology basis. And that's a long-term problem that Clint and I still need to work on along with others. So I'm going to talk about Lake Mead for a little bit. Um, this year's, from the engineer in me, the hydrologist, this year was certainly interesting in Arizona um, and in California and in the Great Basin up on the Wasatch Front um, for a couple of different reasons. I'll focus first on in Arizona. Most everyone in the room is probably familiar that both the Salt and Verde spilled water, saw water in the river down by the airport uh, in the Salt River for frankly weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the exact numbers. The forecast that I'm most familiar with, SRP thought about a million acre feet would spill from the two reservoirs combined. A lot of that disappears in the dry river channel in the Gila, which it is usually most of the time. But if it doesn't, it makes its way down to uh, Painted Rock Dam near Gila Bend, and then is released by the Corps of Engineers to eventually make it to the confluence of the Colorado. I've worked at CAP 23 years, and I think this year is the first time that I am aware of that they had a wet water connection. Maybe in 2005, I need to go back look, but it's a rare occurrence when the salt and verde spill enough to make it to the Colorado. It will this year. It is doing so right now. It's not anywhere close to the million acre feet that spilled from the reservoirs because so much goes into the ground between here and there. But reclamation does work quite hard that if there is water coming in at the confluence, they deliver that to Mexico in lieu of releasing it from Lake Mead. They coordinate those operations. Um, and try to make uh, preserve water in Lake Mead, which is important to us because the state, the federal government, and our partners at Southern Nevada Water Authority and Metropolitan Water District of Southern California have literally spent tens of millions of dollars paying people to conserve water to prop up elevations in Lake Mead. The other interesting thing, thing that happened in Arizona this year is the Bill Williams, which is, uh, if anybody's familiar with Alamo Lake on Arizona's western side, flows into Lake Havasu, it actually had enough natural runoff in Arizona that it contributed about 140,000 acre feet to Lake Havasu. Reclamation did the same thing. They operated the system in a way to preserve a like amount of water not released in Lake Mead. Uh, in 2005, there was actually quite a bit of water that came in on Alamo, and in Reclamation's uh, attempts to maximize the benefit of that water coming into the system, I understand they ran the river, river quite low in the Laughlin area, which which ruined some weddings um, <laughs> on the docks in the spring. But but we we appreciate their actions to try and conserve that water and to again prop up uh, elevations in Lake Mead. And then lastly, we have this thing um, that we refer to uh, on the river called the intermeeting flows, and this is really unmeasured water that comes into the Grand Canyon. And if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon and hiked it, there's, there's springs and all sorts of 
beautiful um, water features surrounding the canyon. There's also a pretty decent watershed on the Kaibab Plateau, which is to the, the north side. And then in Utah, uh, a couple of tributaries, and then also the Little Colorado on, on the Arizona side that all flow into the canyon between Glen Canyon Dam and above Lake Mead. We usually expect about 750,000 acre feet on average to come into the canyon from the intervening flows, but this year there was over a million acre feet that was anticipated due to really more snowpack in some of those very low elevation areas in the Colorado River Basin. So we were getting some tributary flows into Lake Mead, and that's really a positive thing for propping up the reservoir. So when we talk about being concerned about critical elevations in Lake Mead really as early as 2024, 2025, between additional releases that will come from Lake Canyon Dam this year and these lower basin tributary flows, coupled with a lot of conservation that is occurring uh, in Arizona uh, within the CAP system specifically, we will see Lake Mead um, jump up I think it's about 25 to 30 feet, or go from that uh, 29% to 30 uh, to almost 40%. Um, so water conditions are improving. The same thing applies to this reservoir. It's only going from 29 to 30 something. It's not going from 29 to full. And so we still have a nearer term problem in terms of addressing the overall imbalance in the Colorado River, but we certainly have some near term relief uh, in the face of what we were thinking even six months ago, what might be some dramatic cutbacks within the Central Arizona project. All right, I need to move a little quicker. I want to talk a little bit about CAP. I like the hydrology part of my talk the best, but I, I do need to share a couple of critical items. Um, this is Arizona's Colorado River use in 2021. I think it's good to uh, maybe understand that Arizona has a main stem allocation from the Colorado River of about 2.8 million acre feet. Of that, about 1.6 to 1.7 is available under CAP's contract to come into central Arizona. And the remainder of it is used um, by tribal and largely agricultural, even though there are some municipal demands of water users in Arizona that are directly on the Colorado River. So in this bar chart, you kind of see the magnitude of that split. Um, the green on the left is the on-river uh, priorities on the Colorado River and on the right is uh, CAP. CAP, um, I won't spend a lot of time about the, the doctrine of prior appropriation, but CAP is generally a junior water user and consequently its priority is lower than those on-river uses. And so when there are reductions in the river, those reductions to CAP are typically applied first. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. If you don't know where CAP is, it goes to Arizona. Um, this is about this is about uh, who we uh, a, a quick graph on who we deliver water to, kind of by end use. We have a highly contractual relationship in our in our water in uh, in CAP with regard to how, who has access to CAP water. The contracts are generally held by irrigation districts, municipalities, tribal entities, and some industrial interests. Um, there aren't like uh, private private party contracts in, in that sense. Mostly there are public government type entities who have contracts for CAP water. But the end uses look kind of like as described on this graph. The blue section is water that's coming through from the Colorado River through the CAP system and being delivered to municipal water treatment plants and delivered into people's homes. The ownership of that water might belong to the cities themselves or tribes within Arizona have the ability to lease waters to municipalities and so the mix of, there's a mix of who actually owns that water that's going to those, to those uh, treatment plants. There's another good chunk that's going to aquifer recharge. Clint talked a little bit uh, about the groundwater situation in Arizona. Recharge is a huge component of why, uh, and what CAP has done over the years. I don't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but people use recharge in two fundamental ways. One, they take uh, delivery of their CAP water and they store it underground. Um, and they can generate what's called a long-term storage credit. That's a credit in the aquifer that said, I put some Colorado River water here, it's mine, and I can come get it later. The other way is they put it in that year, and they pump it out that year. We call that aquifer storage and recovery. 
Um, and they and the city of Tucson is a, probably the best example of Arizona where they don't take direct delivery of their Central Arizona project water. Rather, they recharge all of it and then they use their groundwater system to pump and, and uh, provide service to their, their, their system. CAP, uh, Clint mentioned the NIA, he mentioned the priorities, he specifically talked about NIA and its reliability in the insured water supply program. I mean, felt, felt good, I had this block here that at least pointed out where it was. This is the priority of CAP water. Generally, the highest priority water is at the bottom and the lower priority water is at the top. And what I wanted to share with you today is what it looks like when there's reductions. And so Clint has included in his presentation a very dense table full of numbers. <laughs> if you were really astute, you saw on the left-hand side that it had levels in Lake Mead and then across it, it was amounts of reduction that are required by current law. There's a line in there for Arizona. Most of it comes to CAP because we're the junior priority within the Central Arizona project. And so there are different tiers that are identified. The take home message I wanted to share with you today is under those existing rules, tier one is actually a pretty big cut. We experienced that for the first time in 2022 and that cut almost 500 and some odd thousand acre feet into the CAP supply or almost a third of it. There are additional reductions that occur, but even if you include all of them, they only go another couple hundred thousand acre feet, as shown in my next slide. The deepest level of reductions is down to what we call a tier three. Um, so you get a sense of how much reduction might occur within the CAP system, and I think it might be good to note the first, um, the first, the lowest priority water within the CAP system was either being used by the Arizona Water Banking Authority to store underground um, to save for a future date for when these occur, or it was largely used by agricultural districts in Pinal County. Uh, they had access to that water um, by policy under our board, and under the, that first big cut, those were the largest, the largest folks who were impacted. There were also reductions to tribal and municipal supplies as a dropped into that, that yellow block, the NIA, the NIA uh, portion. And then of course there are Indian and municipal supplies that are identified on the schematic right now that would be continued to be reduced as the reductions increase. Clint also talked a little bit about what Interior is doing to protect the system. He talked about the low water levels that we were really seeing that were potentially very critical if we had another low runoff year in 2023. Um, consequently, the Department of Interior took action by um, putting out an environmental impact statement so they could have the authority essentially to make more water reductions, less, let less water out of Lake Powell, and then cut water uses in the lower basin by reducing the releases from Lake Mead. They put out that uh, draft environmental impact statement just this last April. We're currently in a comment period. And the intent of the impact statement was in part to evaluate the environmental impacts that would occur if they did these things. But it was also intended to kind of book in the worst types of scenarios that, act that would identify actions that they may take in part to try and bring the parties in the lower basin together to negotiate and find a solution that was better than the two that they had proposed. And I've heard it commonly said, maybe I even said it too, there was something in the SEIS for everyone to hate, all the water users in the lower basin. As a CAP water user, which is represented in the blue here, once elevation got below 1040 in Lake Mead, which is where it's at now, by the way, CAP would go to zero. I hate that. That's a terrible idea. I'm opposed to it. And, but that is part of what was intended to get the lower basin to have the, some of the water users to come together and negotiate it. And the other alternative, which is an alternative where they just went through and cut everybody who was a water user in the lower basin. That's not in strict accordance with priority or, or frankly law for that matter, but we do believe that the secretary has an authority at least to evaluate options like that if not the direct ability to implement them, there are higher priority users, some that were even there using water on the river before um, Hoover Dam was constructed, that object to this, they hate this. Why would you come and hit even the highest priority user on the river? So that out, many of those are in California, um, 
And so the intent was to try and bring the, the parties together to get, continue to get them to negotiate to find a good solution. We've been doing that. We've been doing that for what feels like a very long time. Frankly, as I see Quinn's nod, uh, every, every day is a week, every week's a month, every month is a year. Um, but we're continuing to do that, and certainly there have been some very fruitful conversations, in part helped by the favorable hydrology that we've seen this year. The last thing I wanted to say about the Colorado River is we think we found some near-term relief, in part hydrologic, in part because of federal funding to encourage conservation. We're positive that we can get to an agreement in the lower basin states to avoid some of these horrific outcomes that I've shown on these slides. But there, need, then that needs to pivot to a longer-term conversation on the Colorado River about how to solve what we believe is a gross imbalance between what the watershed is going to yield and what uh, the uses are in the river basin. We as CDP will continue to advocate that uh, the Central Arizona Project is an imperative for Arizona's economy and for the resolution of Native American claims in this state, and there needs to be water in the Central Arizona Project system. And with that, thank you so much for your time, and I'm going to take my break. actually had an opportunity to tour the CAP um, facility here to discuss. I oh. give the best tours too. Yeah, I, I, I have to say. Anymore, but mine are awesome. <laughs> Elena, you've done it, right? So yeah, if you haven't had that opportunity, Paul said, it is unbelievable what they do and the technology they employ. And um, we're probably going to take our leadership, plug for Leadership Academy, because we're probably going to take our Leadership Academy there. So if you want to apply for that in the coming weeks, that would be awesome. All right, next up we have Thomas Locum, General Counsel and Vice President of Corporate Services for EPCOR. Thomas is going to fill us in on the where, what, and how EPCOR gets their water, provides services, and manages the distribution as Arizona's largest private water utility. I have a little bit of a bio on that I can skip it, <laughs> but it's so impressive. I'm going to read really fast. As Vice President of Corporate Services, Thomas develops and implements the company's strategic goals and objectives with the lines of the company's long-term vision and growth within the United States. Among his areas of responsibility are customer care and billing, public and government affairs, information services, and rates and regulations. As General Counsel, Thomas is responsible for all legal matters involving EPCOR USA and its regulated and unregulated U.S. subsidiaries, including corporate and regulatory compliance, litigation, operational agreements, and management of real property issues. Thomas has been in the utility industry for over a decade and practiced commercial litigation before that. He helped me. I have to do this part because this is so impressive. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Politics and Communications from Wake Forest University and earned a Juris Doctorate at the University of Arizona's College of Law. He is active in the nonprofit sector, including previously serving as chair of Hands-On Greater Phoenix and as chair of the Alcoholism and Addiction Assistance Association. He has also been involved with the Arizona State Bar, volunteering in the Member Assistance Program, and is a member of the Executive Committee of the Administrative Section. Please welcome Thomas Logan. Sean was giving you the like, short version, like he does stuff. That's really kind of what it is. I very much appreciate everyone's time today, and I appreciate being uh, asked to come chat. Uh, my goal is just to get a high level overview, like she said, of what we're doing now and what we want to do in the future, and I think the question would be a little more interesting. A little bit about EPCOR, we're in three different states. We provide water and wastewater services and natural gas services to different country, uh, customers throughout number of different communities, 800,000 people served, the last 2,000 in the service connection is critical. In the Greater Valley, these are the areas we serve. Most recently, we acquired Johnson Utilities, which is in the Santan area between Green Creek and Florence, uh, and always looking to, to add more. And the other piece of EPCOR backgrounds, like the obligatory throat clearing, we're heavily regulated by the Arizona Corporation Commission. We're what's called a public service corporation, and that means that the ACC uh, determines how much we can charge our customers, the return on equity we get for any equity investment we make. 
uh, and even what areas that we can serve in terms of our certificate of convenience and necessity. When we do file a, a rate case and try to change our rates, it's a pretty robust process. There's a lot of stakeholder input. There's a, an administrative law that proceeds, uh, presides over a hearing itself, and then the commissioners themselves hear all the parties' positions in a legislative process that they're going to get need. In terms of F4 and water, uh, this is where we get our water. Um, slightly different than the state of Arizona, and this just is largely a function of where we geographically serve. What I'd like to point out, though, is this is a fairly robust and diverse portfolio. If we get cuts on the CAP, I'll, I'll have another slide in a moment what the recent cuts have meant for us. But as, as a general uh, proposition, I, I feel pretty good about this. And a lot of our, even our use of the surface water in the CAP is actually recharged, like, like Patrick discussed. Since we came to Arizona in 2011, we have successfully recharged, meaning the tree, and then inject back into the ground you know, over 21 billion gallons of, of water. And that, that's just a lot of water. But at, at a higher level, uh, EPCOR reuses, recycles 93.7% uh, uh, of our effluent. Uh, and, and we're proud of that. And frankly, we think that should be the type of gold standard, the type of table stakes that all water providers in Arizona should be uh, aspiring to because it's. It's something that can be done with the technology, and what it does is it puts the water back in the aquifer so that later generations can then pull it out. Uh, I'm really glad that the, the people who actually know what they're talking about went first, so if you're mine, just imagine all of their slides and all of the details and facts and figures. For me, I, I didn't go to, to math school, I went to word school. So I actually have words. And you know, with the cuts at the Colorado River, we went to a, a tier 2B, and there were no direct impacts to our customers, and I think that's uh, largely a function of how robust our, our portfolio is. But if there are additional cuts, and there very well could be, there probably won't be this year, uh, we're gonna have to look at alternatives. But it won't just be EPCOR that looks at alternatives, it'll be all other water providers in the state. And that'll have implications for one of my later slides. But if you imagine a world in which all water providers that are providing service to everyone in Arizona are starting to look for all of the other additional supplies, it's gonna be a race. And the price is gonna go higher and higher and higher, and what's available is gonna go quick. And then there's not going to be anything until something different happens, which I'll discuss later. I, I would like to sort of put the nail in the coffin in terms of what, what Clint and Patrick were talking about. We had a great season, but how many, we're going to need a lot more of those if we're going to be able to breathe a sigh of relief in Lake Mead. 29% to maybe 40% is what Patrick said in terms of Lake Mead elevation. If I gave a 40% grade, or my, one of my kids came to me and said, I got a 40% on the test, I'd be like, I turn back around and go right back to school and go back <laughs> until it's like at least a 90. I mean, we're, we have a lot of, we have decades and decades of drought, and the simple fact is I, I don't want anyone having the impression we can breathe a sigh of relief. Are we gonna run out of water today or tomorrow, or next month or next year? No. Uh, we've been, all of us, all of our water providers have been planning for that for a long, long time. Since it's ingrained in our DNA, but the simple fact is, is that we, we can't stop having the conversations of what comes next just because one season we had plenty of rain. I do want to go, and I, I, I'm interesting that Clint used this. I took out all of the fancy stuff, and I just want to tell a very simple story. And in terms of what we're doing next, it starts with, with what, how I see this this graph right here. For me, what this graph means is that our Groundwater Management Act is a success. When ADWR and the Groundwater Management Act were implemented, uh, we immediately started seeing reductions in how much water. And then you see how that plays out over time. We're, we're rocking it. Um, but, and that means that we need to keep it in place. And I raise that in particular because right now at the legislature our, is a proposal to start creating an exception with the Groundwater Management Act. And once you make one exception for one interest group, there's gonna be others who want their own exception and others who say, I can do it even better and give me that. And it's not fair that this other guy got it. And the simple fact is, is that you start pulling the thread and the whole thing unravels. We can't do that. Our, our children and our children's children can't, can't withstand or can't, like, can't carry that with them. We need to preserve the Groundwater Management Act. This is the bedrock of what we've been able to do and, and, and how we're going to ensure the future generations have water and that water providers like EPCOR will be able to continue to serve our customers. We need to leave this intact. It's worked and it's working. And although you might not be the immediate audience for it, it's, it's important enough that I need to share with anyone and everyone who will hear. 
The other thing, I'm going through uh, several different components of what we're doing to try to make sure that we have a robust water future. And the next, I think, and a necessary thing to discuss is conservation. And for me, this is where the rubber hits the road for a lot of our customers. We have customers who come and say, I have a, gig a gigantic leak. They don't actually come to me, but they come to f and they say, I got water leaking everywhere. My bill at, last month was $180, and I usually am around 40 or 50. What do I do? And, and one of the things we offer our customers is we'll have a, a representative sit on the phone and say, okay, let's go through a step-by-step -step list on all the different places you can potentially have leaks and how you can find it. Why don't you start walking around the property and we'll stay on the phone with you and tell me what you're seeing. And if that doesn't work, we'll send a representative out to our customer's house to look for the leak themselves. That, we have online tutorials, we have demonstration gardens, we have everything and anything, uh, conservation kits. And conservation has to be a piece of our long-term solution for water, and, and we need to frankly an all of the above solution, but it starts with conservation and the Groundwater Management Act. And so when I say, uh, how are we gonna do it in the future, and can we do it? Yes, we can, but there's, there's a lot of discipline things we need to do. Stepping aside from law and, and, and what, you, what customers can do for themselves, EPCOR itself is, is, is looking towards the long term, and it falls generally into a couple different buckets on how EPCOR is trying to ensure that for the long term, there is water. And the first involves the larger bucket of making sure that our system is operating efficiently and using the best technology. We see pipes that are, that are starting to leak or starting to deteriorate, we replace them. And we replace them with state-of-the-art technology and state-of-the-art materials that, so they don't leak and they last even longer. Because uh, frankly, we have, uh, when we bought Johnson Utilities that I mentioned earlier, we were losing almost 50% of the water, which is leaking to the ground because the pipes and the like were just decrepit and hadn't been replaced. And we rapidly started replacing all of them. And we've gotten non-revenue water, which is what we referred to, referred to. Actually, I don't want to state a percentage. I'm not exactly sure, but it's below 20%. And, and we want to go even lower at, because uh, frankly, every drop we, we lose is a drop that doesn't get to our customers, that we don't get to sell, and something that isn't, isn't the appropriate uh, use of our, our limited resource. The other bucket I'd say is, is customer tools and technology and information. Sending the information through auto, automated metering infrastructure that says, hey, you know, your current use this month is way more than other days of, uh, from prior months. You should start taking a look at what are you doing? Do you intend to do that? Or maybe they're filling a pool, great. But maybe they don't even realize that they're leaking water everywhere and their bill that month isn't, isn't gonna be what they wanna see. It's something that prompts our customers and empowers them with information so that they can go and try to manage their own use. It's more of a, rather than the conservation kits or the online tutorials, this is something that we want to start providing to our customers so they can use that information so that the water that they take from us is what they intend to take from us. And then the last is new water. The next slide is, I'll talk to you more about new water. Okay, I said earlier, imagine the world in which all the water providers in Arizona say, okay, wait, we've had more cuts and we need to start doing something about it. Let's start chasing more water. In that circumstance, I see, this is kind of how I envision it. All of the low-hanging fruit's been picked. All of the stuff that's easily accessible or otherwise relatively inexpensive. The, the different surface water claims that are out there or the other sort of things that different water providers can be able to do. Some of these folks just work magic. And now we have this different tier of new water resources that's finite and much more expensive. It's still there but they're limited. And once, once water providers really feel the need, they're gonna start, start pursuing those vigorously. An example is a proposal that SRP is currently exploring to, is to raise the Bartlett Dam. And what that would do is create a tremendous additional amount of storage up with the Bartlett, Bartlett Dam. And I'm, I'm sitting on the steering committee for that, and there's uh, 27 other, or I think 27 other water providers from across the, the valley that are looking at that. And we're just kind of hoping that maybe in 10 years, the Bartlett Dam will be raised and there'll be even more, a, a huge, much more of a reservoir there that SRP will release and we'll be able to take some of that water. But that gives you an example of what that second tier of water supply is. It's non-term, meaning we can't necessarily count on it. It's probably gonna be fairly expensive, but it's something that we need to start thinking about for, for the water future for our customers. Beyond that though, I think we need new augmentation. I, I told you we need the Groundwater Management Act, we need a strong emphasis on conservation, but frankly, we need additional water. And you have, uh, there's slides, I think, that Clint uh, didn't get to that concerned WIFA, if you, you watched what he was going through, but the WIFA work and the, the IDE uh, concept of pursuing desalination of Sea of Cortez, yes, check the box, sign me up. Um, water from the Missouri River, yes, check the box, let's start talking about that. From Mississippi, sure, California, I don't know, maybe, 
they're a little crazy over there, but you know they do have a big ocean. It's pretty close. Um, I, what I'm saying is I don't want to rule out any any scenario or any option right now. What I want to do is start talking about all of it collaboratively in a way. What does make sense? What's the most expensive? What should we put? What should we prioritize? And I think there's a couple key aspects of this conversation that I want to share with you. You might not be the audience, but it's something that's critical. First, it's going to be crazy expensive. And, and for me, what that means is that we need to, one, be aware of that before we start talking about it. But also, we got to come up with a way to fairly allocate those costs. Make sure that everyone is, is getting the benefit of that infrastructure and then also contributing their fair share. This is, this is critical. We also have to make sure for those groups who are more disadvantaged and maybe can't afford it, that they also aren't being left out of the water future of Arizona. Uh, and the other is that it will fail. Like I think, in fact, the default is that it's gonna fail unless we are all actively cooperating. And I came up with a totally made up phrase, a comprehensive uh, cooperation. And, and by that, I mean, like when we come to the table, we're like, how can I make everything else better? How can I make sure this works? How can I help rather than coming to the table and saying, how can I get mine? These are my interests. Uh, I want that first. And, and that's the approach that F4 is trying to take because literally this is a circumstance where the rising tide will raise all boats. It's, it's a, a metaphor I, I intended to use and it happens just to be rather apropos, but I think it's necessary. I've been in a few of the conversations in the last couple of years where we have people who have very strong opinions about their own water rights. They're very entrenched, they are politically powerful, and it's, it's very difficult to start pulling apart different concepts, different ways to think of water and water supply in Arizona. They, they just don't want to have those conversations because they like what they have, and they're set. But I'm not sure if that same approach is going to work. And again, you might not be the audience for it, but you will eventually be voting for politicians who are making these decisions. You will be having conversations with your colleagues and your neighbors and your, your church members and your community. These are the types of conversations we have. I don't have the right answers, but I do think that, that this has to be a component of the approach. Uh, of course, actively pursuing, uh, or actively studying, not pursuing, uh, any number of different large scale infrastructure projects and how it can help, whether it is actively doing them or whether it is just providing consulting service. I didn't get into it, but in Texas, we own and operate several long distance uh, water pipelines. We know how to build, we know how to have large well fields and build a huge treatment plants and send large amounts of water. We, serve, we supply 20% of San Antonio's water through the Vista Ridge pipeline. This is something that can be done with 150, 300 mile pipelines. It takes a lot of work though, and I think we can get there in Arizona if we all kind of collaborate. This is the obligatory slide my PR people tell me to put in. Um, but actually, I think it's, it's actually kind of cool stuff. This is not easy stuff to accomplish. It's, it's something that we were uh, provided with and recognized by our stakeholders and other, other uh, <laughs> our peers, essentially. And I'm particularly proud of the safety, uh, the safety awards. We have men and women who work incredibly hard at F4 every day. And it's it critically important that they come, they go home in the same condition they came to work. Um, and this is entirely a result of, of the amazing work they do. That's all about. Thank you very much. going to give us an overview of Scottsdale's water and how its water supply is managed. Gretchen is responsible for managing the city's water resources portfolio and ensuring the city remains in compliance with the Arizona Department of Water Resources assured water supply mandates, which we've heard a lot about and we are um, always more, more interested in hearing how that works. So she also manages the con uh, conservation staff. She is the advisor to city leadership regarding regional, state, and local water issues, as well as legislative issues that may impact the city. Baumgartner has a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering from the University of Arizona, and a Master of Science in Water Resources Engineering from Arizona State University. Please welcome Gretchen Baumgartner.
So I've talked to a number of real estate groups and I always like to um, start off with, I know there's another Gretchen Baumgartner who's a realtor in here now. If, <laughs> if she's here or you see her, I'd love to meet her. Like, I keep getting asked if I sell real estate on the side. And no, I do not. <laughs> so let's dive right in. Um, the speakers here this morning or this afternoon have been kind of on the side because it's hard to, to see our slides unless it's on the side. So I'll try to get this side of the camera too. So we're here in the city of Scottsdale. Um, you know that we're long and skinny. We're all the way to the bottom, almost to the Salt River, all the way up to the top near, uh, near Carefree. Um, this makes it challenging in moving water because of the elevation difference. Um, the energy and water nexus are closely tied. So when you move water uphill, uh, it's a big energy hob. When you treat water, it's a big energy hob. Um, one fun thing about the CEP, uh, Central Arizona Project is the largest uh, energy user in the state because it has to push water all the way uphill from Lake Havasu down up to Tucson. So a little bit about Scottsdale. Uh, we're about 250,000 people as of the last census, maybe a little underneath that. Um, Maricopa Association of Governments have us up at build out about 300, 310,000 folks, so we still have some room to grow. Uh, the water accounts we have in the city of Scottsdale currently are around 93, 94,000 single water accounts. The vast majority of those are single family residents. So about 90, 95 are single family residents, and then you've got multifamily um, apartments, condos, townhomes. And then uh, some commercial and non-residential as well that's, that's in there too. So the commercial entities that are here in town, uh, as well as uh, some uh, turf facilities. Uh, uh, the average delivery, uh, both uh, potable and non-potable, was around 91,000, 92,000 acre feet last year, or 82 million gallons per day. <coughs> so when we talk about our water deliveries here in Scottsdale, even though about 90, 95% of our single our meters are single family resident. Only about 50% of the delivery that we send to our, our customers is single family resident. And so this is, we have to be mindful of who our customer base is. Now regardless whether you're Scottsdale or any other provider, and Edward talked a second ago, is it's really important to understand our customer base, what kind of businesses we have to provide to. Um, because it's the conservation message is important. Everyone has a business to do. Everyone has a home to take care of. So how do we message conservation to our customers? Um, but then also, how do we, how do we price that, that for our customers? Every provider goes through a master planning process about five to seven years or so. Uh, we go through a master planning process about every five years. Um, council just, uh, just approved ours about a year ago. And this is the master planning process is where we look at our infrastructure, our pipes and our pumps and our treatment plant, and the size of those and the size it's gonna need to be as we walk through build out but also what are our demand projections? Uh, so back in 2010, 2005, the demand projections that we all looked at were actually uh, quite steep. And as we walk through technology and how conservation works with our customers, that steep curve has kind of come down. And then you look in the areas of the Scottsdale, I know that it's a very colorful looking area of Scottsdale, so we kind of broke our city up into a couple of different areas. Um, the red lines are those growth potential areas. So when you look at growth, it's not just one scenario that you look at. You have to understand what's the zoning and then what's potentially the future zoning and how do we, how do we grow differently? Um, you go into Old Town, we obviously look a little different than we did 10, 20 years ago. Um, the same thing can be said for Tempe and Gilbert. Our state and our cities look a little differently than they did 10, 20 years ago. So we try to project out, what do we think they're gonna look like in 10, 20, 30 years. And we project out that water usage so we can plan for those scenarios. We also like to plan for conservation inside those scenarios. So if we have a steep curve because we have projected growth as we, as the parcels tend to grow, is how can we have a slant to conservation? How can we talk with our customers to, so they can be as efficient with that water usage as possible? And we integrate that with our water resources. Is what other supplies do we need to go out there and look at uh, depending on what happening in the system in the future. And you've heard Clint and, uh, and Patrick talk, talk a lot about some of the uncertainty in the system. The issue with some water resource master planning is there's a lot of uncertainty in the system. So it's challenging to understand what the system's gonna look like in 10, 15 years, what the governance of the system is gonna look like. And, and Clint had kind of stole a little bit of my thunder, but that's because he asked me the question before he came up here. Um, <laughs> currently, currently uh, our water deliveries are vastly the majority of our Colorado River. 
So this pie chart is how much water is sent on a whole to all of our customers, and 75% of it is Colorado River. Now the very dark gray part is, is groundwater. We send about 4% of our, our deliveries are groundwater, and that's by design. We try not to use hardly any groundwater at all, except for in like peaking, like the summer months, or for water quality issues, because we want to be able to keep our aquifers as healthy as possible underneath us, so when we need to call on those aquifers in time of prolonged drought. I made this very colorful picture um, based on the priority stack for the Central Arizona project. Um, and in it, so on the right hand side is that priority stack that you saw from both Clint and Patrick. Um, and as Lake Mead lowers in elevation, it triggers those cuts on those, those different priority systems. So right now we're in a 2A, which is uh, about 3,400 acre feet for the city of Scottsdale. This is the amount of water that we are, we have available to the city of Scottsdale through the priority system of the Central Arizona project. The vast majority of our water is gonna be M&I or Indian priority. So it's a little bit uh, senior in priority when looking at the top of that stack. So in a tier one, in a two A, and even a T and two B, uh, that water that we get cut is really our savings account water. Um, so it doesn't necessarily affect the customers that we deliver right now. This table is taken right out of the adopted 2021 drought management plan. Uh, this is basically some assumptions that were put into the plan of how much we assume could possibly get cut from the city of Scottsdale and additional shortages. So right now we're in a 2A, so about 3 MGD million gallons per day or 3,400 acre feet. The biggest question is how deep could the shortage go? Now you heard both Clint and Patrick talk about how this year is great and it's a gift and we're gonna use it, but it doesn't mean that necessarily as we walk through the future, um, we're gonna have a number of these years concurrently or what's gonna happen with the governance of the system. So what we plan for is that arrow going to the right and how do we manage our resources and message to our customers the conservation that we need. One of the efforts that we've done and many other providers here in Arizona, um, Thomas talked about it too, is long-term storage credits. Recharging water in the aquifer to put it in our savings account, to be able to call on it. So this is a chart of the additional CAP water that we have access to that we put in the recharge in the aquifer and then also our treated effluent. Um, I know it was, was, it was the leadership. Um, so I, I know that the, we do a lot of tours of the campus. The campus is literally probably like maybe 10 minutes away. Um, so our, our campus is both our, our CP treatment facility and our effluent, our advanced effluent treatment facility where the wastewater in the city gets treated. It gets treated to, to the highest levels um, beyond drinking water standards and it gets A, sent to some of the golf courses up north and be recharged in the area around the campus to be able to utilize for drinking water at a later date and re recover it in groundwater wells. So this is only the last six years or so. We've been doing that for decades. One of the things that I'd like to point out, so on average, the last two years have been somewhat of an exception, but on average, we're around 13 to 15,000 acre feet we recharge annually. I'm gonna go back to this slide. So in a tier three, we made some assumptions and we'd probably be cut around 15,000 acre feet. So what we put in our savings account roughly every year or so um, would cover us in a tier three. Now I like to give the analogy that water resources really into personal finances. Um, so these kind of things are our savings account. Now we have a savings account for, for times of our kids go to college, our AC breaks, our car breaks. We would never want to live in our savings account, but it's there to protect us for many, many years so we can walk through those, those trying and challenging times. Um, the issue is how long do we have to stay in our savings account and how long will it, will it keep us going? So one of the things Scott still has been doing with the, with the uh, institution of this tier one shortage, now the 2A shortage, um, we instituted our drought management plan. We were the first one in the state to do so and all the other cities kind of followed suit. Um, and what that means is we're expanding our conservation programs and messaging. Uh, we're expanding our aquifer storage and recovery well capacity. We're expanding, and I'll talk a little bit about our AMI network and our water smart portal uh, technology. Our HOA program uh, has been drastically popular this year. Um, and we're a part of the, the Bartlett Dam Modification Stakeholder Group and we're examining direct potable raise potential. So the drought management team is made up of a bunch of divisions and departments within the city. It includes city management, economic development, planning, 
park staff, facility staff, and every single month we talk about what the drought means to the city. Um, it's been a really great conversation. It's broken a lot of walls down in the city. We want to ask our customers to save water, but we want to go in front of them and make sure that we're doing exactly what they're asking them. So we're finding ways inside the city of how we save water and how we message that and how we become a team and walk through what's about to happen to us. I manage our conservation staff. Um, I'm proud that Scottsdale has, has a very incredibly robust conservation program and we're growing it um, every single year. Our, we have a really big rebate budget, an incentive budget, which has grown by 200% this year. Uh, we went to council and said, we're gonna spend above and beyond my budget. And they said, go for it. So, and our HOA visits and interests have expanded about 450%. Um, and we're, so we're just trying to add and expand our programs as we walk through this and incentivize people to be as efficient as possible. So one of the things we did with the drought management plan is we asked for folks to voluntarily conserve 5%. We chose 5% because it's a quantitative amount. It's hard to walk to folks through something when they're like, hey, just save water. So really this is inciting, inciting people to look at your water bill, look at your water usage and quantify it and find ways to save water. The majority of folks at home could save water just by finding the leak that is probably inside their home or inside their landscape. The majority of leaks will probably be inside your landscape and people don't even realize Uh, automatic meter infrastructure. Um, so the majority of the city below the 101 has what's called an AMI meter, which if you look at your water bill in the past, it's just a chunk of your uh, monthly usage, right? To 20,000 gallons, 30,000 gallons. That doesn't help you manage your water because you don't understand what that means at 6 a.m. when your irrigation goes up. The automatic meter infrastructure can give water data at an hourly basis. It can also give leak alerts. After a 72 hour period, if you have a specific usage over, uh, we said it, uh, 15, gallon, 15 gallons per minute, uh, it'll alert you for an email or a text. Um, so we're building that infrastructure. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll get that <clears throat> infrastructure up north of the 101. And some of the infrastructure, infrastructure projects that we're doing, and um, as Thomas had said, is these infrastructure projects are wildly expensive. Um, their infra any infrastructure project, especially right now, um, is quite costly. But as you walk through the technology for new water, it's quite expensive. So it's really hard to see that, that figure on the left, my apologies. So around the campus, we built, um, we're in the process of building four aquifer storage and recovery wells. These are really big wells anywhere. If they're all run at the same time, would be about 8,000 acre feet of recovered water in the groundwater system. Um, we are exploring direct potable reuse, both up at the campus, but also regionally. Uh, a bunch of regional folks are having conversations with uh, the city of Phoenix to find ways to partner with the federal government to see if direct potable reuse, which is uh, treating uh, reclaimed water to an advanced degree above uh, drinking water standards and delivering it to, to customers. And then, as you mentioned, actually, I'm, there is a BART Dam meeting currently right now going on. Um, the Bartlett Dam stakeholders are having conversations about uh, re reconstructing and, and raising Bartlett Dam to be able to capture that Verde River water, which spills about 40% of the time. The system is, is, is uh, understored and trying to capture that water so it doesn't go down to go down to past the city of Phoenix. So in summary, like the rest of the, the folks had said today, is we this year has been amazing. It's given us a gift and it's given us a little bit of time that we're not going to fall off the precipice just yet. It doesn't mean we have to stop the conversation about finding new sources of water, being as efficient as we can, or having conservation messages with our customers, but also ourselves. Um, I had this, we did a conference last week, and someone asked me, someone asked me a question that was actually asked in a different panel, is um, how do you stop people from saying, it's my neighbor, it's not me? You're not going to stop people from doing it. That's what they do. That's what we do. So the, the process of conservation is walking someone through it without, without shaming them. We can all conserve water. It's amazing, most people don't realize in the business they do, in the home that they live, there are ways to hone in and be efficient as they can with every drop they can. It's just a matter of holding a customer's hand and walking them through ways to save water. Thank you. See. Um, hopefully you can hear me if I pull up way up here. Yes, yes, okay, good. Um, wow, thanks Gretchen, that was very, very helpful. You're sticking around for the panel, right? Uh, good. 
good. All right, next up we have from Arizona State University, we're gonna welcome Claire Lori and Lauer, sorry. Claire Lauer, is that Lauer? Yes? There she is? Oh, don't, don't pull that one. I can. We're gonna launch. Okay, right, we don't lose anybody. And Sarah Porter to learn how ASMB, I have some things I'm gonna say about it. Oh, really? Yeah, no. <laughs> I cross some things, I cross some things out. Yeah, just so good. Just say the first one. All right, I'm gonna go yeah, fast again. <laughs> Um, they're going to uh, talk about issues in water policy and what they are working on to provide better water resource tools, which all of you uh, can take advantage of. Sarah Porter is the director of the Kyle Center for Water Policy at Morrison Institute. Sarah also is an attorney, having graduated from Harvard University with a bachelor's degree and obtaining a Juris Doctor from another Juris Doctor from Arizona State for she's She cut me off. Okay, I'm going to be. Um, Who's the first line? I, I yeah, won't get yeah. asked you. Yeah. Claire Lauer. She is the professor of technical communication and faculty in the user experience master's program at ASU. And you guys have talked about yourselves. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Welcome, Claire and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Is this on? I think uh, push the button. Sorry? Hold the button. Hold the button down? Oh, this button. No, those right. buttons. This button. That's the one piece of training we need to get. <laughs> check, check, check. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, very nice to be with you all. Oh, we're on. Um, <laughs> just a word, so uh, the introduction that we didn't allow um, is that, so Claire and I are both from ASU. My part of, the part of ASU that, that I am most affiliated with is a nonpartisan think tank focusing on water, the Kyle Center for Water Policy. Uh, and we're part of Arizona's oldest and premier policy think tank, Morrison Institute for Public Policy, which is about 42 years old. So just wanted you to know where we're where coming from. Did you also want to? No. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so let me, we really practice this really well. Um, let me share a little bit. We, the Kyle Center has developed a lot of the kind of things you expect from a think tank, meaning critical analyses, white papers, but we, we're here to talk about the tools that we've developed to help well, to help people who might not want to pick up a critical analysis that's 220 pages on an obscure, um, you know, Arizona water policy and seeing some <coughs> nods. So the thing that we've developed at the Kyle Center, let me go back, that is of most relevance is the Arizona Water Blueprint. And there's the website, or you can Google Arizona Water Blueprint. And basically, it is a hub of neutral, nonpartisan information about Arizona water resources and policy. This is what the landing page looks like. And I'd like to just show you a couple of highlights from the landing page. I won't spend too much time on the blueprint. But the blueprint itself has um, uh, the, the blueprint map, which is an interactive map with about 60 different data layers that you can click on and off. And there are pop-ups with all kinds of information that you can see, for example, population growth in cities. Um, who are the water providers for cities? Is this city, is this address inside a place where groundwater is managed? You can get all kinds of information from the map. We also have a tool that shows changes in groundwater levels. That's often in the news. Um, it's not so relevant to Scottsdale, but it's relevant in our rural parts of the state where groundwater isn't regulated. Um, and that tool can be helpful for just showing you what's going on. We have a number of different tools and a big story map on what we've been talking most about today, the Colorado River shortage. And we update this, the, I say story map, it's really an explainer and it's very pretty. And we update it uh, when there are things to, to add, to update it about, so that can be helpful. And finally, we have an area um, that has uh, explainers on individual um, issue, water issues um, that go into some depth including one on augmentation concepts. In other words, concepts for bringing more water supplies to communities in Arizona. So hopefully the blueprint, we'll talk about it more, could be a tool that would be helpful. Oh, and here's what the augmentation concepts uh, explainer looks like. And as you can see, it's divided into different types of groundwater, ocean desalination, brackish groundwater, the different types. And there's a lot of detail about every concept, for example, the Bartlett Dam modification, which Gretchen men mentioned. And you know, not all augmentation projects are alike. 
some ideas for bringing more water into the state, like uh, let's say hauling icebergs. That's a real idea that some people have out there. And hauling icebergs may not be as practical as enlarging Bartlett Dam. How do you know? How can you assess? You can go to our augmentation concepts page and it will have such detail as the lifespan of the project, how much water it would mean, and what the cost of that water would be. So I hope that that will be a helpful tool for you. Um, again, our groundwater level changes app, another helpful tool. How many of you have heard news stories about uh, a Saudi dairy that is using <laughs> up all the groundwater? Yeah, well, that's a really, you know, that is an issue in our rural areas. Um, from Phoenix to Tucson and, and beyond, as, as Thomas mentioned, we have rigorous groundwater regulations. So we're protected from that kind of thing. But if we're gonna think about what's happening with that place, you know, it might be good to go look at the sub-basin where it's happening, which is somewhere around there, and our groundwater level changes app shows that that sub-basin actually is not declining. Doesn't mean it won't, but it tells us something about the urgency of the problem. So again, a tool that can help us understand better what's going on. So this, uh, my I guess my graphic didn't translate quite right, but let me take a moment on this. Now, so that's the Arizona water blueprint. I hope you'll all uh, visit it. Uh, we, we have almost monthly uh, a program called Office Hours for the Arizona Water Blueprint where we have a, a sort of webinar uh, brown bag lunch. You, lunch isn't required, but you can sign up for our office hours and come to us and ask us questions about water or questions about how to use the blueprint or different tools. So you can email me or you can go to the, you'll see the sign up for the office hours on the Kyle Center's website and on the blueprint. Now I want to talk about our other big tool, which is still a little bit underdeveloped, as you can see from my weird graphic here, um, <laughs> but, but it's really relevant to what we've talked about today. And that's a tool called the Colorado River Visualization Enterprise. Yeah, it's a mouthful and a weird name, but we like it because it shortens to curve. And so, we, you know, that's catchy. Um, so the curve is a tool that shows how each and every Colorado River water entitlement holder, meaning a city, a tribe, an irrigation district that has an entitlement to Colorado River water in Arizona, what, their, what kind of rights they have, what is, do they have low priority rights or high priority rights, and what are they actually doing with that water? So we spent a lot of time looking at the actual uses the different entitlement holders, like especially cities, are making of their Colorado River water. And this graphic, I'll, I'll show you the curve in a moment, but this graphic um, sort of sums it up. This is a graphic based on the uses of water in 2022 when we were in a, a, a big shortage. We had about a third of the water from the Colorado River um, short, essentially shorted. And, and what we found when we looked at what was the actual use that was made of Colorado River water was that cities, even in a shortage, were still sending a lot of their water to farms. And because when cities send their water to farms that would otherwise use groundwater, cities can get long-term storage credits, groundwater storage credits for that. Because the farm's using surface water rather than groundwater. And so what that told us that cities that we could have even deeper shortages that wouldn't be terribly disruptive necessarily to cities because cities still had not built out their demand to use all of their Colorado River water. Um, and so what we found is that cities in 2022 were sending about 300,000 acre feet of water. And I, you know, we've all kind of tossed around that volumetric acre feet. What is an uh -huh. acre foot? An acre foot is 326,000 roughly gallons, exactly 325, 851 gallons of water. But a, a way to think about an acre foot is that four fairly efficient modern single family homes will use one acre foot per year. A field of cotton might use four to six acre feet um, for, you know, per season. Uh, you can pretty much put almost unlimited amounts of acre feet of water on an alfalfa field because it keeps growing and you can cut it and grow it some more and cut it some more. So, but it kind of tells you what we're talking about in terms of volume. So that, that was an important finding of this tool we developed for the Arizona curve. 
Um, you can Google Arizona Curtain and find it. And, if, and I think I need the person on the computer to find the thing that starts the video by moving the cursor down kind of near the bottom of the slide, but not the absolute bottom, kind of bottom <laughs> left, yeah, and start the video. And I'll show you, this is one of the things you can look at at the curve. This is an example of what we found for the city of Phoenix. You can see how Phoenix, um, where Phoenix gets its water and how much of each of Phoenix's supply of water is going to what use. So Gretchen shared that kind of information for Scottsdale. I didn't, I knew we have Gretchen here with those details, so I didn't uh, do a, a Scottsdale video, but you can pick any city in Arizona that uses Colorado River water and you can get this information. And when you look at Phoenix, you can see that Phoenix doesn't deliver much of its Colorado River water to taps. Gretchen talked about how Scottsdale <coughs> uses about, about three fourths of their Colorado River water to meet demand at taps. And demand at tap is one of those important things to look at when we're thinking about how would shortages be disruptive to cities. So that, that is an example of what you can do with the curve. And then finally, um, <laughs> Uh, I just thought it would be nice to throw in this praise from the um, now retired chief hydrologist from the Department of Water Resources who says, you know, that it's the kinds of tools of um, like, I mean, maybe we're asking the wrong expert, but I mean, the top hydrologist for the Department of Water Resources may not be your best authority on how to translate information for um, layperson's use. But, but it was nice that he recognized the value of the blueprint to help a larger audience um, understand issues about water policy in Arizona. And what Claire and I are very hopeful that we can take away from today's meeting, because Claire is an expert in how to communicate with people who aren't in my silo, my little technocratic silo. <laughs> so what we're really hoping for is how can we improve on the blueprint, improve on the curve, develop new tools that will help us uh, provide information that will be useful and needed by realtors and by other people in uh, the land use industry. One more slide. Oh, one more slide. Oh, so, so to, that, to that end, <laughs> um, we have developed a survey, and I think many of you have a little flyer with the QR code for the survey, and it would mean the world to us if you would please fill out the survey. It's pretty quick. Yeah, let me just say a few words um, before you go ahead and do that. So many of you have probably heard of the Arizona Water Innovation Initiative. It's uh, funded through the Piper Trust and through the state of Arizona, and they gave ASU quite a bit of money to do quite a few things, but one of the things they wanted to do was figure out how to take information about water, about drought conservation, and so on, and make it have impact on public audiences. And the problem that uh, ASU has, and a lot of technical entities have, is that we have a lot of scientists, and a lot of highly technical people, who do not have a lot of practice translating their information and their findings to uh, people who don't do what they do. So my job is the user experience architect of this initiative. And what that basically means is that I get to talk to people outside of ASU and outside of technical fields, and I get to ask them what information they would like and what information would help them do their jobs better. So we've actually already had several interviews with realtors around <coughs> the state and they have told us quite a few really interesting things about what uh, they talk about in terms of water, what they'd like to know, what, where they get their information, what they don't know, and what resources that they would find helpful that we might be able to provide to them. And that is what our job is going to be over the next few years, is making sure that you all and the clients that you serve understand what's going on uh, around the state in terms of water and get the questions you have answered. So our goal is to make the Arizona Blueprint more of a information gateway site, integrate all of the tools that ASU has developed, make those tools more usable and more understandable. And forgive me if I will say that when you do visit the Curve tool, it is under development. And you may find that there's a lot of technical language that still sort of dominates your experience of that site. 
that's the perfect example of a type of tool that was developed by experts that we are now trying to translate to a public audience so that it doesn't feel quite so uh, exclusive and technical and that it makes sense to you all and to me. Uh, so anyway, what we're doing today, what we'd really love for you to do is click on the QR code or, or take a photo of the QR code here, or I believe um, I have two grad students with me today and they handed out some uh, flyers with the QR code. It's not the one on the little card. I should clarify that. There's an ASU, this is the one that we handed out right here. You can also hold your phone up to the screen and it will probably register. Um, we, it's, it's a three minute survey. So go ahead and do it right now if you don't mind. And it basically asks you those questions that I just identified. Uh, where do you get your information? What would you like to know more about? And we're going to take that information and help us inform our efforts to make this kind of content more accessible and useful for you and your clients. Yes, we do. So we, we have time, time for you to fill out now. the survey now. And Clara is an <laughs> ASU professor, so <laughs> this is in class. Yeah, so no class, please. It's your end of year evaluation. <laughs> oh boy. Slides are going to be available, and you can have it on the slides as well. So, how many of you were able to finish it? Hopefully, oh, look at you! Very good. All right, so we're going to move on and rounding out our speakers for today. Let's welcome Katie Prendergast, Executive Director for the Arizona Alliance for Golf, to teach us how our Arizona golf courses conserve water more efficiently than you may think. Take your time, Karen, with Katie, because I'm going to read slow, but you're going to go this way, so you don't have to. There you are. You're already up. Okay, good. Um, Katie is, a, uh, is also director at Horizon Strategy, a Phoenix-based public affairs firm that engages all, at multiple levels of government and in broader strategic consulting. A native of Scottsdale, her professional background is in government and politics, including working for a number of Arizona elected officials and lobbying on behalf of one of the state's largest employers. Please welcome Katie Pendergast. Industry moving forward. 
Uh, by way of very brief background, the Alliance was formed in 2020, really with water as a driving catalyst. Uh, there were a number of decisions being made at the policy and regulatory level, and given the implications um, on the Arizona golf industry, uh, we were formed in an effort to unify and, and organize the collective voice of golf here in Arizona. Um, our mission is really to be an educational resource for policymakers, regulators, government staff, uh, private sector leaders, um, in, in terms of informing about the impact of the Arizona golf industry on the economy, on the environment, and certainly in the water uh, stewardship sphere. Um, the Alliance represents a diverse group of golf associations in Arizona, uh, and we've also developed a number of partnerships um, with key industries like the tourism and food and beverage sector. We know that the golf industry and Arizona's tourism industry are inextricably linked, and we really believe that um, the real estate industry is an example of a sector uh, that's very much tied and connected to golf as well. Uh, as this room knows, golf continues to help fuel real estate activity in Arizona. Uh, one of the first things we did upon forming the alliance was to work with Arizona economist Jim Rounds and his team at Rounds Consulting Group to start to quantify uh, golf's impact in Arizona through a variety of lenses. One of those was golf, and based on an updated study that was released in January of this year, um, it's clear that golf continues to have a very positive effect on residential real estate values in Arizona. Um, as you can see, Rounds Consulting Group examined home sales data for a variety of different neighborhoods within the state. Um, for each of the neighborhoods examined, the homes within residential golf communities had higher average sale prices in 2019 than the average home price for the broader neighborhood, uh, with the exception of Tinkerty and Tucson. Um, overall, within this small case study, the golf course premium ranged between 18% and 40%. Numerous studies have been done on the golf and real estate nexus. Um, a recent one by the National Recreation and Parks Association found that properties that view a golf course, even if they're not part of that golf community, have a higher um, property value of anywhere between 15 and 30%. Um, as this group knows, golf has really been foundational to the development of the city of Scottsdale. Particularly in North Scottsdale, golf courses have been the anchor to many of those communities, um, and our goal is to ensure that golf continues to be central to the vibrancy of those communities. Um, when it comes to golf, most people don't know the efficiencies and technologies in place at Arizona golf courses, and I think that that drives a lot of the public misconception when non-golfers see a, a green golf course. Um, but in reality, Arizona golf courses have a long history of water stewardship and innovation, um, starting in the mid-1980s as a result of regulatory signals designed to better manage uh, groundwater use. Golf courses were incentivized to have smaller designs um, with a limit of up to 90 <coughs> acres for golf courses constructed um, after that date. Before the 1980 Groundwater Management Act, golf courses were designed and planned in a very different way. Thanks to the great work of state policy leaders at the time, the continued leadership of the Arizona Department of Water Resources, um, golf began developing more water-wise courses decades ago. As many of you may know and have seen it, if you've sold properties in North Scottsdale or have listings in that area, um, newer golf courses are designed with um, as small a turf footprint as possible. Um, so again, those courses are great examples where you have you know, literally circles of turf interspersed among desert landscaping to create almost a target golf environment. Um, as we think about golf course uh, water innovation and efficiency, one of the ways the industry is innovating is in the research sphere. Um, there's been significant and ongoing research done into new and more drought tolerant strains of grass. And we're now actually seeing golf courses test out various strains to evaluate playability and water consumption. Um, those tests are being incorporated into more and more courses within Scottsdale, um, recognizing that this is just one way that we can continually work to reduce our water consumption. 
Uh, in addition to more thoughtful designs, non-golfers may be surprised to learn how efficient the systems in place to manage water on golf courses are. Um, each course has a weather station uh, that allows um, the ability to track meteorological conditions, uh, and then you can adjust water rates down to the second. So um, these course systems track precipitation, humidity, wind, those are all factors that dictate how much water a golf course receives on a daily basis. Courses have invested in and utilized state-of-the-art technology to make sure we're um, making every drop of water count. There are water moisture meters at courses to determine when the turf needs to be watered to make certain that no uh, amount of the green is receiving too much water. Um, each individual sprinkler head can be controlled at those weather stations. Um, and they can be adjusted according to slope and soil characteristics. Uh, so this technology means we can be incredibly precise and use only as much water as needed. Uh, Arizona golf courses have been steadily <coughs> introducing new technology and innovation for decades. As part of the effort to continually reduce their water footprint, uh, larger, older golf courses are continuing to invest in projects that remove turf and replace that grass with native vegetation. Uh, removing turf is the single biggest way uh, to reduce water consumption at golf courses, and there are examples throughout the state uh, of courses investing in those projects to redu reduce their turf and water usage at the same time. Um, there's a course in Gilbert that's actually undertaken a project to narrow their fairways to reduce turf, so they're redesigning um, all of the fairways on the course uh, to create narrow spaces where the grass uh, needs to be green. Um, it's worth noting that golf course water accounts for 2% of the state's total water supply um, and provides environmental benefits as well in terms of helping mitigate heat island effects in our more populous and urban areas. Uh, sustainable water management is of course the right thing to do um, and it's also a core business practice at Arizona golf courses because excess water negatively impacts playability and in courses bottom line. Uh, water is typically, of course, this top monthly cost, um, and these are factors um, that I think remind us that there's no business incentive for golf courses to use more water than absolutely necessary. Uh, as an example, Greyhawk Golf Club in North Scottsdale spends over a million dollars a year just in water, um, and so there are very real environmental, regulatory, and economic reasons for courses to use as little water as possible. Um, the industry is also continually exploring policy and infrastructure solutions to assist in reducing our water footprint. Um, one example that we're really proud of has been in a long-standing partnership with the City of Scottsdale uh, that allows the 23 golf courses in North Scottsdale to operate on reclaimed water. Uh, since the early 1990s, the City of Scottsdale has been providing non-potable water to these golf courses through a public-private partnership known as the Reclaimed Water Distribution System, or RDWS. Um, the RWDS is a complex system of pipelines, booster stations, and water treatment facilities uh, capable of delivering 20 million gallons a day of non-potable water for golf course irrigation. Uh, this partnership was first conceived and negotiated by the Desert Mountain Properties in the city of Scottsdale um, as a means of terminating North Scottsdale Golf Club's reliance on groundwater uh, for turf irrigation. Through the agreement to date, these golf clubs have invested $55 million to build and fund the capital improvements necessary um, and now expand the water treatment facility to improve the quality of water being delivered. This partnership has been funded by these golf courses and ensures that no taxpayer uh, or ratepayer fees are used. And interestingly, in the winter months when golf courses use less water, the excess water is further purified beyond drinking water standards um, and injected into the, uh, into the aquifer for storage and recovery potential during shortages to help preserve Scottsdale's water supply and advance their sustainability efforts. Um, these are the types of innovative partnerships that we as an industry would love to replicate around the state. Golf is really interested in new infrastructure opportunities that can help grow access to affluent water. Uh, while many courses currently use affluent water, there remains a great industry on, I'm sorry, great interest on the industry's perspective 
um, and overcoming infrastructure barriers for those that don't currently have a way of accessing that water source. Uh, while Arizona golf courses have a long history of needing increasing conservation as called out in various regulatory plans, uh, we know that the water challenge is only increasing uh, based on you know, what we've heard today. We know we all need to do more and golf will be at the table. Uh, the Alliance mindset is that we're all in this together and the more we can collaborate, partner, uh, and participate in solutions while having fact-based conversations, the better off we'll all be. Um, Scottsdale is an international destination for golf. Golf certainly has been part of the fabric of the city as Scottsdale has grown. Um, we're so looking forward to engaging more closely with the Scottsdale Area Association of Realtors, and thank you for the time today. that you guys can share. So um, hopefully you got your questions and I see some really excellent questions. I love this part of our um, love this part of our seminar. Oh, yeah. We'll just exhale. Oh you have a seat? Yeah anywhere it's fine. Excuse me. Make yourself comfortable. So unfortunately, uh, Clint Chandler and Patrick Dunn uh, had to be called away on important meetings, so they both were not able to join us for the Q&A. Uh, but we have plenty of experts in the room still, so that's that's really good. If you need a water, go. Oh my gosh, you need a water. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Um, and you know, this is relax, everyone. Um, this is the fun part. Hopefully, if you didn't get your question and you still think of it, go ahead and send it in. Our staff is kind of going through them. What's wrong? Here's another microphone. Yeah. Let's turn that baby on. Check, check, check. Check, check. All right. Um, I don't need this. I'm going to use this one. So the first question. What is the best and easiest way to explain our water status to people who are scared to move and buy homes here. I know that all of you encounter that. Who wants to take that first? Well, I've encountered that question too. Um, so we, you know, it's a little bit of threading the needle in that we don't necessarily want to, to negate what's going on, but also we don't want to fear monger. So, um, in almost everything everyone said today is, is we have a diverse portfolio. And I'm just gonna answer for Scott's stuff so the questions I get. Um, we have a diverse portfolio. We minimize groundwater currently so to store for future usage. We are investing in infrastructure projects. We are investing in conservation. Um, walking into the future is every resident's job and goal to make sure that we're as efficient and, and conservation minded as possible. Um, and, and it's important to keep our economy healthy. So we continue to do things to plan into the future. And uh, we don't wanna shut our doors, but we wanna be mindful in how we grow. And, uh, Thank you. Could, could I add that in the, a lot of the arid Southwest and especially uh, the greater Phoenix area, we have decoupled population growth from water demand. And Clint's slide and Patrick had the same slide that showed how we're using the same amount of water since the mid 50s that we, you know, and yet we have almost six times the population. And so I think it's really important for people to understand that providing water to cities is a very solvable problem that Arizona has been solving since before statehood. And that, you know, if you look around the country and you look at the natural resources challenges that different places have, you could go to Texas and how do you wrangle hurricanes? How do you keep New Orleans from dropping into the ocean? Boston is building a seawall to hold back rising ocean levels. I will choose the problem of getting more water to Scottsdale. This, this is a very, very solvable problem. Every city in the country is facing big challenges. Ours happens to be one that's very, very solvable. 
I love this era. I used to live on the East Coast, and hurricanes were definitely mm -hmm. a lot more to worry about on any given day. So, excellent. Anybody else want to weigh in, or we can come back to you? Okay. Um, what was that? I don't want to follow that. No, don't follow that. Okay, that's very good. Yeah, she didn't bring up. So, I think Thomas answered this uh, question when he gave us that visual of the uh, lots of the, the rain that we've had recently is just a drop in the lake. So the question was, how did this year's rain affect our water supply? And I think he kind of answered that. It's, it's a, just a little piece uh, and not a, not, we can't get really excited about that. And would you agree, Thomas? Yeah, and I think uh, it was Clint's percentages also, from 29% to maybe 40%. And that's, that's just, we've had decades of drought. You're not gonna reverse that in one season. Right, okay. Um, I love this question because I see a lot of de development going on, not necessarily in Scottsdale, but in some of the other really high growth areas, and they're still putting in lawns. So the question is, would it help to ban lawns? Nobody wants to touch that. <laughs> you want to sit down with that? Um, Go for it, Brendan. I think when we, we talk about how we walk through with water policy, the word ban is gonna be, I just, I don't wanna touch that word. Um, we encourage, incentive, so people not to do it. I, I gave this, this the, kind of, uh, the, the seatbelts the other day, I was actually talking to golf. Um, in that, do you remember in the 90s how we all didn't have to wear seatbelts and then we had to wear seatbelts and people didn't want to, and now we don't even think about it. So when we talk about mandates or restrictions or banning, um, there is some potential there to find ways to kind of, again, thread the needle between the stick and the carrot. Um, in Scottsdale, and I know other Valley cities, we want to be really mindful of our customer base and how we do that. Um, we're not gonna outright ban grass. Uh, we're going to have a conversation. We're going to further our, our incentives. We're going to double the pot of money we will give them. Um, we'll have a conversation about new construction and new builds and how we limit um, the difference between functional and non-functional grass. I think that's the new conversation we have with functional and non-functional. Um, we had that conversation. We went to council two weeks ago, and we talked about how we wanted to have that conversation about new single-family residents and not being able to put front yard lawns in. Now, most actually don't, um, but we want to have a conversation about what that could look like inside the city and then further, further incentivize those folks that already have non-functional turf. By keeping functional turf, the, the, the areas of grass that we find functionality for our, our animals and our children and our economy um, and really efficiency. You wanna... Well, I think it's a wonderful question because it, what it does is highlight that it's largely a matter of choice. How, what, what else do we want to use the water for? Cities that are already here that have pretty robust water portfolios benefit when we retire grass because it means that they can use those water supplies to meet some other need. Growth areas are really not using that much grass. It's usually in the front facing places because they know, you know, they, they want, they are working hard on keeping water consumption down. But so I hate to say don't retire grass. If you want to retire your grass, it's one of the best things that you can do to help Gretchen or your city because they can use that water for something else. But what kind of city do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a city that doesn't have golf courses, that doesn't have grass in parks? doesn't have big shady trees, whatever, doesn't have swimming pools. The, these, are, these discussions are largely about the choices for how we want to use land, what we want us, our cities to look like. Grass isn't a very good cooler in terms of evapotranspiration, but it does provide some you know, cooling, it's pretty. There are arguments for it. This is really about choices. Well, just as an organization, we have vacillated. We have that grass out there. But it's doing two things. It is doing the cooling, but it's also when it floods in this area, and it does it often because we're kind of in that kind of an area. It stops that water from coming closer to the building. So there's a lot of things I think you got to take into consideration. Thank, thank you for that, Sarah. Um, I'm going to stay with you if, I, if you don't mind. Do you know what is the percentage amount of wasted water in agricultural um, use because of inefficiency, and what conservation methods can be implemented to reduce? 
Sure, you know, agriculture, um, first of all, remember the active management areas, the, the places between, you know, that where groundwater is regulated, that would be, you know, Prescott and then Phoenix down to Tucson and below and Douglas now. In those places, we have uh, agricultural conservation efficiencies that are stepped up every 10 years. So agriculture is required to be pretty efficient. They laser level their fields, they make sure that they're using water very efficiently. Likewise, in the southwestern corner of the state, Yuma County has made huge investments in efficiency because they understood a long time ago that you know we would all be looking to Yuma um, for extra water. So they really worked on showing that they're using their water. You know, the mo they're getting the most crop per drop. So there are s just a few places in rural areas where agriculture maybe could make some improvements in efficiency. But those places are not going to result in um, benefits for cities. Those are places that are using typically local groundwater or a local surface water supply that never would become available. So we, we need to stop thinking of agriculture as um, the enemy or the ones using all the water and otherwise there'd be water for cities. It's more complicated than that. What about um, more drought? tolerant plants versus some of the things that they're doing right now. Well, I'm, I'm. We happen to be doing a study on that very question um, currently, and we've been interviewing um, farmers, and there really isn't much of a market for, let's say, Waiuli or Hohopa or the other low water use plants that farmers could grow. Um, not only is there much of a market, they can't make much money. And really what we're learning that's the most interesting is that farmers in the Phoenix area and Pinal County they think there is a time limit um, for farming. And so there, many of them are leasing the lands they farm, and they don't know whether they'll be farming those lands in five years, maybe not even in two years. And so it, it, they cannot pencil out big investments. There, there are some attempts. BF Goodrich is piloting a program to uh, support farmers to grow Waiuli, which BF Goodrich might make into rubber to make tires, but there, there's, the jury's out. Um, likewise, in using drip irrigation, that may work in some places, but uh, it's very expensive, and it, you know, it's, the jury's out on whether that's going to lead to uh, better yields and less water use. And in the end, there are very few places left where um, water efficiency will translate into water for the Phoenix area, and I, I just want to qualify that. Out there brewing on the horizon is another big battle between Central Arizona and the and the Western, you know, communities, Yuma to uh, Bullhead City, about whether more water should be moved from the Colorado River in the West to support, you know, the glorious cities in Central Arizona, and there are people who would take both sides of that argument, but. Um, make it right now the opportunities to just get them to be efficient so that there would be more water. The, the, that, most of that has already occurred. Okay, thank you. Wow. No complexities there at all, right? Um, I love this question. Was there any noticeable water savings from the HOAs which did not oversee this past year? I know here in the Perimeter Center, I'm on their board, we decided not to do that. And we did see some significant changes. Has anyone else seen that? Um, is that an effective tool? Well, it, it's, it can be kind of challenging to, to quantify that when we look at all of our meters. So we have had a challenging time just because the weather, um, temperature play a role too. We have anecdotal stories of, of HOAs finding savings themselves. Um, I Anecdotally, I had one HOA call me and they had three common areas. And they their question was, well, we still want one common area for, for community gathering. And absolutely, was we the message was not take away all your water usage for, for those grass areas. It was find the ways that you have the functionality for your community and find other ways that you can save water. So it was really a meeting in the middle. Um, so we do have some anecdotal stories of, of savings for those. And, and Katie, are you doing any of that in the golf course world? Just not having it it's so green. <laughs> you know, we are uh, on the golf courses themselves. I think, you know, as we proceed, you'll see more and more golf courses that opt to not oversee um, areas of the course that are outside of the playable area. So 
I think you'll see more courses where you have the brown grass and sort of the rough area. Um, I, you know, water is top of mind for every single golf course in Arizona, and there is a continued drive to examine, you know, what is the overseeding window, how much do we really need, can we get by with, you know, less green golf courses because we recognize the severity of the current challenge. Great, thank you. Um, I think this one is also for you, Gretchen, if, uh, or anybody who wants to weigh in. And I, I guess I understand this question. If we are low on water, why let the water flood out of rivers across the state and in the valley? Why not capture it? Um, is there a way to do that? I don't even know. Someone knows. Someone knows the answer. Well, that's what all that talk about Bartlett Dam was. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, so that's to capture that water. Gretchen had great stats on that. And also, um, SRP is piloting a program to store just a little bit more water in Roosevelt Dam. But also, a lot of that water as it flows down the riverbed is recharging that's right good. there. So it's not it's not wasted. So I'm going to actually just make one more comment here. Sure. So. Uh, SRP water, salt and verdure water, uh, when it's stored behind the, the dams there, they're what's called a pertinent to the land, so they're they're tied to the rights of the land. So, so South Scottsdale, uh, south of the, the um, Arizona uh, Canal. However, if you get water above those those the what we call member um, those dams, it's it's not member water. It's not tied to the land. It's it's free water. So for I want to say about a five or six week period, they were spilling. And so what we did and a lot of other cities did is uh, we turned on our treatment facility, which is normally down in the, in the winter months, and we pumped that water north, which displaced uh, CP water. And that happens when there's a spill event. So what we do is we move water in a, in a really flexible way, and we'll have to do that as we move through the future, is be more flexible in the ways we capture wet periods of time, is, is how do we have exchanges with other cities? How do we have exchanges with other entities like that? Um, how do we move water in our distribution system in different ways that we're not used to? And it's because of the Groundwater Management Act that enables cities to, for example, what Scottsdale does like crazy, take water and put it in aquifers and accrue credits um, that makes those kinds of really very creative um, activities possible. If, you, if Scottsdale didn't know for sure that it would have those credits or EPCOR, then it wouldn't be worth their trouble to do those things. I'm going to ask this question now so we don't run out of time. We have about 13 minutes still, so um, each of you answer this question. Are we going to run out of water? <laughs> I love the way you pass the microphone immediately. Sarah's like, I'm not going first. <laughs> I'm, I'm the technical communicator of the group, and I'll say no. Good. Anybody want to that? Anybody want to doom about it more? On the contrary, no, we're not. We have robust water supplies. Our aquifers are very rich. We've been spending decades on replenishing them and growing them. And I showed the graph. Clint showed the graph. We know what we're doing. All of us do. And not only that, but EPCOR is one of many companies and, and entities that are looking on how to build out those long-term water supplies with the next CAP, and so when I, I talked about infrastructure projects, that's what I had in mind, is the next CAP. You know, the, the best time to start that conversation was probably 20 years ago, and the second best time is today. And that's what we're doing. Um, I don't, it's gonna be an enormous effort, and it's gonna require a lot of people and a lot of money, but you know, we start now, we start chipping away at it, we start getting in place the legislation, what policies we need, we start corralling the financing, we develop the route, we, get the appropriate permits and environmental permissions and we move forward and it will happen, it will take time. But my hope is that if we uh, pursue it with enough vigor and that's what we're doing, it'll it'll come at the right time. I'm actually gonna, I am gonna be a little bit, I don't wanna say doom and gloom, but I'm gonna add to that because this is a, a good news story that we're all saying up here that we're not gonna run out of water. And it doesn't mean that we all get to leave this room and say, they got that, not to work. we're good. <laughs> It's the the ability to get to the place we need to get to is going to be a big lift, and it's so it's it's a every Arizona needs to be a part of the equation. We're we're still not there yet, um, so we we all have to be a part of this as we move into the future. Okay, thank you. Um, this question dropped off. Maybe Suzanne decided we don't want to tackle it. The one about desalinization. Huh. We're, we're miss it. Yeah, I, I heard everybody wants to talk about it. You know. Um, I remember when I lived 
lived on the East Coast here in the Chesapeake Bay area. Of course, there's a lot of salt water there. But they looked into it and studied for years and years, and they ended up banning it because of the cost. So can someone speak to that? It's almost like, should we even be talking about it? Is there a potential for it? We should be talking about all of the different options. And there is potential, but you might have noticed that we don't have a coastline here in Arizona. I did notice that. <laughs> when they first started talking about it, like, <laughs> well, let me just mention that California is having trouble building a desalt plant to serve California. And arguably, California has much bigger water challenges than Arizona. So think of that. They have a big coastline. They're having a lot of trouble. It's very politically difficult. And they probably don't have a big interest in helping Arizona get a desal plant, or get water and benefit from a desal plant. Um, there has been an ongoing, long, binational desalination scoping project between Arizona and Sonora, Mexico. And the idea is not what you might think, which is that we would pipe that water up. That could happen, but that would be very, very energy intensive, very, very expensive. The idea is that water users in Mexico would use the water from the desal plant, and Arizona users who would pay for all that would take an exchange of Mexico's desalinated ocean water. Um, there, I, I guess I'd say there's a good chance that, you know, before I die, that will happen. But it, you don't want to build a desal plant when you still have much cheaper options to develop. Bartlett Dam, Roosevelt Dam, leasing water. There's a tribe on the main stem, the Colorado River Indian tribes, who now have the authorization to lease water. Um, we still have opportunities to deploy brackish groundwater. And the, the biggest and cheapest opportunity at all for a city like Scottsdale is simply reducing water use, reducing demand, making sure that you have, or F4, make sure you have no leaks in your system, as Thomas talked about. So it's out there, but so, uh, can I just say, yeah, um, in San Diego, they're paying over $3,000 an acre foot for desalinated ocean water next door. I know that an acre foot of treated groundwater is something like 500 bucks, you know? Cool. So that, that's sort of ap the apples and oranges, a little less. So that's your apples and oranges. So and, and that's next door. You know, it, right, yeah, it's not even quite that anywhere. So along those same lines, and I'm sure your answer is going to be similar, is going to be, I grew up in Michigan and Ohio, so we got a beautiful, great lakes, right? Are they going to suck that water down here in Arizona? They have already <laughs> formed a compact to prevent that from happening. Okay. So it could, again, it could happen, but the Great Lakes states are not interested. Canada is not interested. Alaska is not interested. Washington and Oregon are not interested. And they, you know, they, there are other issues. We. You know, there are many water users between us and those water supplies that also have huge challenges between us and the Mississippi River, between us and the Missouri River. There are many, many customers for that water. Whereas just in the big scheme of things, you know, cities use only about 22% of the state's water supply. We, we don't need very much water to be able to grow and flourish and have beautiful cities and strong economies. So to that point, one of the questions that came up was, what is one, I know it's a smaller piece of the pie, but um, home usage, what is one of the effective devices we can either add or replace in our homes that will conserve the most water? And maybe that's a rush. Yeah, your, your outdoor, outdoor use. Outdoor use. Yep. Okay. Um, so I, I'm gonna give it a little bit of a maybe unpopular opinion. Um, so, so we, we this Scottsdale is an amazing city. It's a, it's a great city that we, we live in. Um, and so there's this, uh, I have a lovely relationship with, with the GPC metric, gallons per capita per day. It depends on the variables you put inside of it and the viewpoint you look at it. Everyone kind of games the system. I'm gonna say that. And then also the next thing I'm gonna say is, we're still one of the higher cities in the state when it comes to GPC. And I'm talking residential GPC, I'm not putting commercial in there to it. So it's the, and that's, most of that's gonna be outdoor usage. So we talk about leaks near irrigation system. We're gonna go through a whole campaign this summer about uh, how appropriately watering should be used. We see customers time and time again water their grass every single day. You do not need to do that in the summer. So it's, it's A, how do you appropriately water your outdoor usage, and then B, Take a really hard look at the, the, the functional versus the non-functional grass that you have in your yard. 
where are your kids playing? I, I, have, a, I have a daughter, I have backyard grass, and it's, it's amazing and great. Um, she doesn't play in the front yard. It's not necessary to have those kind of things. So I think those are the messages that we have to have a conversation about is where is the desert beauty that we have in our landscapes and where is the necessary grass that we have in our landscapes and how to have the functionality in that. And then the efficiency is how do we have a conversation with our landscapers and make sure that we really dial it in. Because like Sarah said, is the drop that we don't use, it's for our future, it's for our children. It's how we have our sustainable city. So you want to add anything? Uh, what about pools too? Does anyone, anyone comment on pools as well? I mean, pool covers are, are fantastic. I personally install one. It, it prevents the, the, a noticeable degree of evaporation uh, in terms of just watching my water levels and hearing the water pump going. That's anecdotal, but I think it makes sense for obvious reasons. But 70% of the, our customers' water usage is outdoors. And that's the biggest thing for your property. I mean, for the most part, modern day appliances are, are really good. Um, the issue is that irrigation isn't always up. So. And almost all, let's just say that all the water that goes down the drain or is flushed that can be recycled is being recycled. Uh, so that's why, why reducing water use indoors is, it's good, but it's a lot less important than reducing water use outdoors. City, Gretchen can't capture your outdoor water use and recycle it. She can capture almost every drop that you flush or send down the drain. So I have to, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I have to ask a question because the plant is right up here and we've toured it on many occasions. How many of you have tried the toilet to tap water, I call it? I did it. I know my leadership academy people did it. Yeah? Was it? I know you don't call it that. Advanced, advanced, what do you call it? What do you call it? Advanced what? Advanced. We used to say direct potable reuse, but now we direct. say advanced purification. But people don't understand what that That's is. That's exactly why we <laughs> yeah. say that. But can, I, can I also say, if you've had any tap it water, it, you effectively yeah. had the same thing. You've had the same thing, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we drink uh, Las Vegas's uh, Affluent. Affluent, yeah. meaning the same thing. So, um, but you know, think about it, 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 you know, it's those kinds of things, right, that people have to just get over. Is it, is it, a, is it a mental thing? Is it a, what is what is it that people are so hesitant? Because I tell you, we had a group, I don't remember, at least 50, 60 people, right, Corinne? And I would say maybe 15, 16 were willing to try it, even though it's purer than the water that, you know, they're used to drinking. What is that? Well, I'll tell you, our experience over the last year, we've had, uh, we've been at a few of the festivals and we've had, uh, we had a grad student who um, did a whole project on direct spotable reuse. And uh, we had a whole um, walkthrough that showed exactly how the water is processed and treated and to what standards and how, and through all of these different phases. And then at the end, we had uh, different uh, water stations that you could try the different water. And everyone, without fail, who tried the DPR water uh, was pleasantly surprised. Yeah, and I don't think actually it's have to put, it's so purified, don't they have to actually put yeah, the minerals back into it? it. Yeah. I mean, so, you're, yeah, you're safe. Try it. It's really great. Okay. Um, <laughs> some of these questions are really technical, so I'm, I, I probably will not do those, um, Suzanne, but we just want to remind people that if you have questions that weren't answered today, um, just let us know and we will get you the answers. But this one is about Lake Mead and Powell. They're expected to hit around 40% of capacity. Is there a way to measure the percent of capacity for groundwater? If so, what is expect the expected? Yes, there is. <laughs> there are a few. There are a few different ways, but I think Claire wants me to talk about the, the amazing scientists that ASU just brought on, who can do, use this satellite data to show what's going on with um, groundwater basins. His name is Jay Fenoyetti. More on that. But our own Arizona Department of Water Resources models groundwater basins. They've modeled the lower Hacienda where Buckeye is. They've modeled the Bunal Basin. They're modeling some rural basins. And they will very soon release a model for the Phoenix area, the, East, the Salt River Valley Basin. And what they do is they model out to a depth of 1,000 feet, which is how deep you're allowed to pump, how, how will the groundwater be used over the next hundred years, modeling um, residential use, commercial use, all the different uses. In the two that they've issued within the active management areas, the department has found that, that groundwater is over-allocated. 
We expect that the Salt River model will also conclude, this is a regulatory model, but that, that it's over allocated. Um, that's a hundred years out to the future. It doesn't mean it will happen. It's just a signal. Of, and the effect of that model, as it was in Buckeye and as it was in Pinal County, which matters to people in the real estate industry, is that new subdivisions can't get their assured water supply certificate to be planted until they find a different water supply, not groundwater. And so a place like Scottsdale that has a different, an assured water supply designation, the platinum standard for water planning is not impacted by that. But in the places that are sort of out there where the subdivision itself has to become the water provider, this will have an impact. Okay, wow. Um, we can't have a water summit without bringing up Rio Verde. Yeah. Um, I actually think I heard something on the news. I, heard something. I think I think Gretchen's going to answer. I heard something on the news this morning that the state legislature took a position that says basically Scottsdale, you're going to have to keep giving them water until we figure something else. Well, it's on the governor's desk at the moment. Okay, the governor's so, signing it. I, I and also, I can't comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. But um, Thomas might be able to do this. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was on the news, so I don't think it's yeah. a secret. Yeah, of course. What's your question? <laughs> <laughs> My understanding is that it's kicked down the, down, down the road a little bit. Is that what your understanding is? What's kicked down? Uh, the real Verity getting water from Scottsdale. Sorry, I, I was testifying for three days in a hearing on this, so I'm oh, okay. very precise on what your questions are. Okay. Uh, all I can speak to is from Air Force perspective. We filed an application to provide service to the Rio Verde foothills. If approved, which it is not yet approved, uh, in two to three years, we will have a standpipe in operation. Right, so until then, the standpipe that's currently there, that is Scottsdale's, correct, is gonna be, how is the water gonna get? We have only been focused on the long-term solution. Okay. The, the, the short-term solutions. Gretchen, you were like, well, so yeah, the person you're holding the state attorney's, attorney's office. I because we're in litigation, I, I literally can't, I can't say anything. So I'm, say no more. If yeah. the governor signs that bill, maybe there will be more litigation. It's possible. I think the more important thing about Rio Verde is that the, this is a community that where the homes were built through the you know under the six home requirement that triggers a hundred year assured water supply. Um, they were not built within a city that has an even higher standard, you know, the assured water supply designation. And so this, you know, for realtors, I think the takeaway is make sure, is that make sure that your, your customer knows, your client knows, is this home in an assured water supply designated city? If so, don't, I would say don't worry. If it's an if the home is in an assured water supply certificated uh, subdivision, that's super good. That means that that development had a hundred year supply of water. They proved it. If it's outside of one of those two things, then you begin asking questions. Right, and I, and I have to give kudos to the Arizona Association of Realtors and our contracts that you all use because it is very clear. The disclosures are very clear. I've actually had. City council members call me like trying, they're trying to find someone to blame, right? So why not the realtors? And I show them the language. It's in a big square highlighted box. It talks about where the water's coming from and it specifically states if it's not an assured water source. So you guys are doing your job, but I agree. Emphasizing it um, even more is very important. So thank you for that answer. Um, all right, we have time for no more questions unless people are willing to take a couple more minutes for one of the ones that I really wanted to get to. Um, a lot of people come, uh, commenting about how complicated this issue is, and that's why we do this every year. So make it a habit of coming every year because you always um, are going to learn something. And this is something I think I can ask this question, and it's a big takeaway. Anyone know the comparative consumption of water by single family homes versus multi family buildings? Multi family uses a lot less water per person. Re typically, reason being, they don't have great big yards where 70% of their water goes. Almost all of the water that's being used can be reclaimed and reused. So, multi family tends to get you to more water sustainability. There's a limit, 
Um, Gretchen and Thomas probably know a lot about that, but it's typically it's not a it, it's less water per person. Excellent. So the narrative sometimes is the opposite of that. So just make sure that you have the right information, you share the right information. Um, this has been a great panel. I want to thank you guys uh, so much for coming today. And of course, it wouldn't be anything without you guys being here. So thank you. Applause for you. <laughs> Elena and Mary are back there. Say hi to them again. Uh, talk to them about the services they provide. We thank them for being our marketing partner. And unless I miss something, staff, are we good? Fill out those surveys, you'll get some slides, you'll get a really cool packet with all the information about our speakers and the resources. So thank you for coming. Let's give them a, a panel of applause, please.